Welcome to Van Lathan's The Red Pill, where we give you the brutal reality, the truth, the brutal honesty of truth. Uh, two guests on a jumbo size episode of The Red Pill today. First guest, Ferrari Shepard, artist, musician, activist, reluctant activist, he says, and Twitter firebrand. You guys might know Ferrari um, from taking on people on Twitter, uh, for being one of the best contemporary artists around. Um, we talked to him about a great many things, what it's like to be black in the art world, uh, what it's like to live your self-expression, some problems that he's had coming from the hood in Chicago to being one of the uh, hottest rising young painters and artists um, of his generation and just sort of the whole gamut of how he sees society, how he sees his place in it and how he uses art to affect culture and to change the world that he lives in. Ferrari is an unbelievably uh, interesting fellow with a lot of different ideas on things. Um, and he was going to tell you, uh, frankly, on why he feels like he has to leave the hood behind. He says it right there. Get away from it. Um, uh, also, we talked to Sharice Rhodes. She is a, a, a very impressive young lady. She is running for a county supervisor, county supervisor here uh, in Los Angeles. It's a very inspirational story. This sister, not too long ago, was homeless with her young son and decided that she was going to get up and do something to change the system that failed her by reshaping it um, uh, at, at the top of it. I, I think that these are the stories and these are the, the, the people that uh, for the rest of my career, I'm going to want you guys to hear about. Now, Sharice is a young politician. Um, she is still learning a lot about the process. She's still learning a lot about what it takes to be successful as a politician. Uh, but listening to her, one thing that you will uh, come away with is that there is a burning desire to be an agent for change. And anytime that is present inside of someone, you'll see them get to the point of success uh, that they want to get to. And I am happy to be able to help her um, on her rise. She's been very persistent about coming on to the podcast for a long time, and we're excited to have her here. All right, now, um, we're going to get to those in, this, in a second. Uh, I just want to say something to um, a specific group of people out here, and that group is the Trump supporters. Now, normally when I talk to the Trump supporters, I just say, fuck you guys. That's normally what I will well, say. I get, though, that that might be counterproductive in terms of the intellectual discourse in America. You can't just say fuck everyone you don't agree with, right? Um, uh, so I won't say that. I have something else to say to y'all. Ah, <laughs> it's almost over. Anyone who is paying attention to what's going on in Washington right now knows that if you're a Trump supporter, your asshole is like that. Before it was like this because... He was fucking you in it pretty regularly and widening it up. It's called a gape. My porn days right there. Shout out. Um, but now it's like this, right? Your asshole is like this. And why is your asshole so tight? Shout out to Flagrant 2. It's so tight because your boy is on the ropes. God damn. He's what it, it, the reckless and sort of cavalier way in which this man has approached Governing the free world um, has finally seemingly come back to bite him in the ass. Now, impeachment processes are nasty. Uh, the slowing of the economy is not a positive thing. So it gives me no glee in my heart to see America go through what's going to be a long and sort of uh, contentious process to prosecute the president. It's something that we all wish were not happening. Well, excuse me, wish was not happening. It's something that all something that we all wish was not happening. However, the reality is that for whatever reason, America made the decision to entrust its safety and its immediate future into the hands of, at best, a income fucking poop, and at worst, a dangerous predatorial megalomaniac. Now, I don't believe 
uh, that we have seen the full consequences of what we have done to our country yet. I believe that those consequences are to come. However, I am very, very happy that the Democrats have got off their cowardly asses and decided to move on impeaching this president. There are a million things that he could have that he could have been impeached on before, if you ask me. But now, seemingly with this deal over uh, the phone call in the Ukraine, there is some there, there, Godspeed to them. Listen, the job was always too big for President Trump, whether or not he is impeached or not, whether or not he is impeached or removed or not. There has got to be, if you are an objective person at all, some buyer's remorse if you supported President Trump. There's got to be. I just can't believe that you guys are that stupid. Maybe you are. I say all that to say this. This is not the last time we're going to be confronted with someone like this who seeks power in our society. I believe that the election of President Trump is most dangerous because we're going to see a lot more people that are just like him. I'm hoping that this process of bringing charges against the president, of impeaching the president, is a difficult one so that we can see that sometimes the best way to deal with a problem is to avoid creating it in the first place. Hopefully, the next time someone who is clearly unbalanced, clearly not up to the job, steps before us to seek the highest office in the land, that we'll have the intelligence the patience, the dignity, and the decency to not grant him or her that power. All right, enough of me. Uh, fuck you guys, Trump supporters. Fuck y'all. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> let's get to Ferrari and Cherise. Pop some pills. We out. White people clap for Ferrari Shepard. You, you know what? Gotta be honest with you, Crystal. You don't be wanting to clap. You gotta clap for people. <laughs> right, and exactly. She's not, she's not white, she's Mexican. Yeah, Mes- um, Mes- we, Mexican. Mexican. We were talking about earlier when she walked in here, Ferrari made a face because Ferrari very notoriously oh has problems with Mexican people. And we hope that to. That is untrue. That's one of the things that we'll hope to work through on this particular podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, now, brother, me and you uh, have known each other for a little while now. Tell me. Tell them right now, the people that are listening and watching the podcast, who Ferrari Shepard is. Who is Ferrari Shepard? Mm-hmm. I'm a hustler. No, mm. I'm just playing. No, I, I really am. Like, um, I mean, the word hustler is kind of given a bad word, like somebody trying to get something out of you. Mm-hmm. I definitely am not that type of person. Mm-hmm. Um, I work like a maniac. Uh, you know, some most people think that being your own boss or being an entrepreneur is easier because I don't have to get, I can sleep all day if I want to. Right. But, you know, like, you know, I have to keep myself in check. So it's a lot of work. I'm an artist. I'm passionate. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even call my, I wouldn't call myself a activist mm-hmm. at all. Like I kind of always fought against that title right. because I know actual activists who, you know, they do this like 24-7 and it's their job and I'm not that person. Mm. Like sometimes like I'll, I'll feel passionately about something and I will uh, organize around it or I'll do whatever I can. But to me, that's just being human. Right. Like we all should do that. Right. Yeah. So let's start off with the art because that's what your calling is and what, what it is that you do. Yeah. The art. Tell us about the journey. Um, first of all, tell us about being a black artist. Right. Okay. And when we say artist, like, I know that, you know, you guys are talking about, we're not talking about musical artists. We're talking about Ferrari paints. Yeah. You paint. Your, and I make music. And you make music. Because yeah. everybody got to make music now, right? You can't I mean, no, now. no. I actually, like, I made most Def's last album, Hated to Love It. And it was my first album, my you only made album. It. Yeah. What do you mean you made it? I produced it. I arranged We've it. We've never talked about this. One time we talked about it. Really? We did talk about it one time. So, so that's you're, how obscure it is, you know. Right. What I'm so, like, so you, so you're an artist in the true sense of it is that you, 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 you do the painting, music, whatever it is artistic out there. That right. You're a part of it. You know, the, I, I actually, you know, outside of music, uh, I never really took music seriously. To be honest, it was something I did to like to relax myself. Right. And. When uh, most, Yassine Bey is what he's going by now. When he heard it, he was like, you know, who is that? And I'm like, it's me. 
Mm-hmm. So after that, we started just making song after song, and then it started to become kind of serious. Mm-hmm. We started talking to Jay, you know, at Title, and now we're gonna have an album. And I'm right. like, oh shit, you know. So I'm in, um, I think I was in Georgetown in the H and M. Mm-hmm. And it was like some dude just following me, and I'm like, "Yo, you good?" Right. And by then, by th- by this time, like the news had came out that you know December '99, Ferrari Shepard and Yasin Bay will be coming out. So this dude, he he approaches me. He was like, "You know, don't fuck up." That's what he told me. And he I was you, like, "Don't fuck, don't up. fuck up." And I'm like, "What you tell you?" He was like literally talking about like this album because he was so much of a fan, a most mm-hmm. deaf fan. And I'm just like, "Dude, I was just playing, like mm-hmm. not playing. Like I take everything that I do seriously, and I'm." passionate but i'm not one of those like hip-hop heads where it's just like jay dillo you know yeah, yeah, kanye yeah. and i'm just like dude i'm i'm actually making an art album mm-hmm. like this is what i think sounds good and i at the time i was listening to a lot of joy division and you know obviously i'm a hip-hop person or rap person mm-hmm. you know so i was bringing all of those elements together and i was like i want to couple it with you know yasin bay who is super vo- versatile people credit People credit Drake as like the first singer rapper, but actually, you know, and Andre 3000, but yeah. actually it was also most deaf was right, in there sure. with that. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's kind of like uh, what I, be, I, I became na- known for for a minute. And it was kind of like, yo, I got to shake that because I do so much, so many other things, you know, mm-hmm. in terms of, um, you know, fine art. That's how I started. I started at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. So that's where you're. So you're from Chicago. Yeah. You started at the Art Institute. Yeah, I spent of lots. You know, a lot of time in New York. Like, mm-hmm. you know, raised out there partially. Right. And um, went to the School of the Art Institute, and it was like a super culture shock for me, because growing up, all I knew were like black people, uh, Puerto Ricans, you know, Dominicans, and to be centered in this place where it was like. You know, 1% black or mm-hmm. Latino, you know, a lot of Asian people, a lot of uh, white people and people doing drugs, you know, like because right. where I grew up, it was like if it was anything other than like a blunt or a beer or maybe some like some Hennessy or something like right. that, Hennessy. Right. Then we, you a crackhead. You like, straight a fiend. Yeah, you a fiend. You like you can't come back and like that's it's different now because they do everything. But when I was growing up, you couldn't come back. I was like, yeah, man, we were getting high off some blow. Not like, no fucking nigga, you a crackhead. <laughs> right, you, you about pookie. to get roasted. You uh, uh, G money from uh, from from New Jack City. Like you can't like you can't do those other drugs. Right, but now exactly. it's like yeah, yeah, and and it's just weird to kind of see that coming to the culture, um, like being completely transparent I basically you know I experimented some yeah. in college it's art college you know and you know you, you get have, high off that you cocaine have some, you have like a circle of white girls doing a seance and you know what I'm saying high off coke. cocaine and shit mm-hmm. like or no and my thing was acid Jesus like Christ. acid like right. for real like LSD wow. actually is not First of all, it's not as bad as when you say LSD. They say, like, you know, people go jump off of buildings and right. all of that. They don't talk about the times where someone does an LSD trip and realizes that the universe is actually like this together, expand, expanding, whatever. It, that's why. Are you on the shit me. right now? Because it seems like you are. I, I am. Because like, I it's am like, right now. You're, 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 you're talking about the universe is <laughs> ever expand. So, like, you know what? Your you know face is turning into it's a deer right now. People drop, <laughs> people, like, yeah. I talked to this one guy. And he was like, uh, this is one of the most talented people uh, that I've ever been around. And I was like, yo, man, like what, how do you see the world differently than what we see? And he says, he said acid. No, seriously. He said, he said, he said acid is the way that he does that. I mean, Chance had the album Acid Rap, but right. seriously, like when I did LSD for the first time, like it was the craziest trip ever. Because first of all, it takes an hour to kick in. So I was, I remember, I, I was, it was on Halloween night, and I was... The I, fucking worst time that you could choose <laughs> to try acid for the first fucking... You wanted to have a bad trip. Right, exactly. So I'm like, I'm on the blue line. That's in Chicago. It's the subway, LL or whatever. Mm-hmm. And this German shepherd dog, there was like mm-hmm. a police dog, just started speaking to me, you know, through my mind or whatever. And I was like, oh, shit, it's starting to happen, right? So we left the train, get out of the train. I felt like I was walking on What was the water- German Shepherd the- saying? I forget. It was something like the universe, you know, and all of this, stu- <laughs> this type of shit. I'm serious. Felt like I was walking on a waterbed, but I was on Conquer on the platform, mm-hmm. you know? So we're going up 
the you know up to the street level and I then this this feeling of like I'm dead and we're going to be judged by God right now came it, it, right. no shit right. go into the party same situation on this wood floor it was in a basketball court type of thing I was like you know walking and it was like just drips of water but it was actually the wood yeah this guy was sitting on the uh, on a speaker across from me dressed like the devil this Halloween right. And he starts to speak to me about the girl that I came with. Her name was Chris. He was like, she's trying to hurt you. She wants to hurt you. Right. <laughs> and I'm like. Bro, I'm I just let like, you know. What you've described so far, this sounds like a lot of fun, right? No, no, no. No, nigga. I'm going to get to the fun. It sounds fucking horrible. No, I'm going like, to get to the fun. <laughs> I'm going to get to the fun. The fun right. was, okay, I flipped out for a minute. I was like, oh, God, this dude. So then I went over to the guy and I said to him with my, you know, not t- telepathically. I said, what are you? <laughs> I said, what I said, what did you just say to me? Cause he told me she's trying to hurt me. He was like, You heard what I said. Fuck me up. And I was like, ah, so I'm freaking out. So my man who did the shit with me, we could curse on here, right? Of yeah. course. To did the shit with me. Right. He was like, Ferrari, he was like, you gotta calm down. Mm-hmm. He was like, right now you're on a mind altering drug that whatever you create in your mind will will manifest in reality. Okay? He says, says, let's do something fun. So we started moving the cars down the block. He was like, you know, you see that? Let's make a wave and move this car. And it was really like some special effects in a movie. We were moving the cars. Then it became fun. We're looking at our hands. We're seeing the blood travel through there. Mm-hmm. Your senses. So I did this about four times. <laughs> Listen, you, you clowning me. I'm not clowning you, you at you all. You clowning me. Like, look, look, look. It, you know what? I'm not clowning you at all. I, I am it. riveted, No, I did. I swear. Okay, so okay. Let's, let's, keep it, let's keep it 100, right? Right now, I'm going to pat myself on the back, right? Okay. All month, I sold out my studio. Okay. okay? Well, that's a big deal when you're an artist, you know, Give it especially. Up you sold out the studio. Thank you. Thank you. I sold out my studio. And that's a big deal for an artist because... You know, especially if you're making large works or something, because it's a substantial amount of, you know, resources, revenue or whatever. But you're trying to say in your Ferrari speak, you made a lot of fucking money. I made some money. There you go. I didn't make a lot of money. I didn't make IRS money. Right. I mean, I, 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 you know, I'm fucking with it. Yeah. You know, but uh, no. So let's just get back. So before I did, because I did acid four times in college. Before that, my art was mediocre, man. Like, my thoughts, I remember it. I used to be struggling to come up with something that was good, and it was, like, mediocre. I did it the fourth time, and it tweaked something permanently in me to make the person that you now know that's sitting here with you. Mm. So and just like so if I, did, if, if I did it again, I think that it would change something else, and then it would be totally different. A friend of mine you know? told me that his acting, greatest of all time, He's, well, he's a fantastic actor, but he says that he was able to see wavelengths that he couldn't possibly see because of acid. And you're saying that he's that is he's not telling the truth. So you got to think about it. we have. They only say we use ten percent of or what is it? Yeah, ten percent of our brain 10, between ten and thirteen or something. like Right. That. Mm-hmm. This opens up another like percentage. Well, we'll, we'll just put it like this. Mm-hmm. You, I entered up. You can't eat on it. Because every you're so sensitive. I entered this um, cafe. It was all night cafe. The lights were so bright. I could hear people's teeth clamping against the forks. Mm-hmm. And this was not all in my mind. Like the your senses are heightened. Mm-hmm. So people, you know, acid is kind of like something that CIA came up with. Yeah. But before that, there was peyote. Mm-hmm. And peyote was something Native that was, Americans. Yeah, Native Americans are using ritual because it brought you to another. The doors of perception will be open, you mm-hmm. know. So, like, I don't need to do, like, I'm older now. Like, I don't need to. Uh, you don't need to exp- drop acid all yeah, the time. Yeah, I don't need to experiment anymore. Right. You know, like, I'm right. good. I think I know that wine right. is good. Right. We're drinking some wine right now. What we're kind drink- of wine is this that we're drinking? This is, uh, I'm not going to give them a commercial, but this is some good wine. It's some Chardonnay. Okay. I'm going to, um, I got a basketball game later, so I'm going to go in there just, like, just off the hoop. wine and just hoop. Just go. It's actually good for you. It's not good for you, but I'm going to tell you. It's yeah, I'm about to say. You know? Like, um, so <laughs> you, you. Ask me this question. You're an artist, and that comes from within, right? Mm-hmm. What does art school teach an artist? How to answer emails. <laughs> you know, like, no, no, seriously, I'm, I'm being honest. Like, how to articulate and speak in a way that, you know, that's, that's what I think college is. It's like it basically teaches you how to speak this language of professionalism. Mm-hmm. You know, and some people might call that white people's, <laughs> right. you know, they say how to speak white or think white. But it's actually just professionalism and how to organize your, 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 your thoughts and your ideas. 
But particularly, like, I can't, like, discredit art school. I went to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Mm -hmm. So, you know, every week we had three to four critiques. Mm -hmm. So that means you're, you're making work, and the, the professor and your, and your fellow students will tear your shit apart. Or they'll tell you what's right with it. So the only rule was you could, if you say, excuse me, if you say I don't like something, you ha we will have to give a reason. Right. Why you have to articulate why you don't you don't like it and how it could be improved, you know. So what this is ultimately doing is preparing a professional artist for a life of critique, mm. because I don't care how good or how how much uh, you know a claim you have going, you're gonna have critics coming to your show, and their job is to uh, exalt and criticize you, mm. you know. So you you gotta have like thick skin. I recently went through something like that where. This has been the best month of my life, to be honest with you, you know, in terms of like the professional moves I've been making, but it has not come without critique. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'll get my stuff will get be sent by certain dealers to um, to museums and to galleries, high end, you know, galleries. And some of them will just shit on you. They'll say, nah, fuck them. Yeah. And this comes back to you. And of course, you take it personally. But then I also I'm starting to learn. I'm you know, I'm still new in this in a way because, you know, I moved from I moved from journalism to music and to back to fine art. So it's like I miss miss some things that I'm trying to make up. But those same people will turn around next week and say, This is brilliant. Mm. They're just fucking with you. You right. know, it's right. like they're just fucking with you. And value is you were asking about that before we got on air. You you asked about val uh, how is value assigned to an artist. Yeah. It's the same as the rap game, the same. So they'd be like, "Who is buzzing? Who's buzzing? Who?" You know, I I have collectors. My collectors they'll ask me. They'll say, "Is this person? What do you think of this work?" And I'll tell them. I say, "It's cool." Like blah blah blah. But then he'll say, uh, "Do you think they're are they buzzing? Are yeah. they buzzing?" Because if someone, let's just say hypothetically, someone buys my, my work right now for $15,000, what they're banking on is that it's an investment that in five to 10 years, it's going to be 150000 250000 right. 1 million. And it, and it happens so often. So what a lot of collectors do, it seems, you know, from the outside looking in, is that they, uh, they're hedging their bets and putting up real real money and everything but the one thing that they want to know is that you're consistent and that you're going to be that you're still going to be doing this in 20 years and um you know one you know you can make some good money right. doing it you know right. so that whole like the paradigm of the starving artist dismantle like anybody watching this any kids watching this that want to make art Put that out of your mind that you're going to be starving. It's not true. That's over with, okay? The starving artist is over with, you It's saying. over. I mean, you go, you go, you have to starve sometimes to get to where you want to go. But, like, the ultimate, because I think the, the main narrative has always been that if you're an artist, you're not going to get any money until you're dead. Like, or your family will get money, you know? Yeah. Which used to happen in the past. Like, Van Gogh famously only sold one painting in his life. And it was to his brother for rent money, mm -hmm. you know, and he's one of the greatest uh, painters that we know in the 21st, 20, 20th and 21st century. Mm -hmm. The thing is, though, that, you know, um, I would say I would say I want to say Picasso mm -hmm. was the first rock star rock star yeah. where he said, no, you're going to pay me millions of dollars while I'm alive. Right. You know, and, you know, uh, Warhol came and he cemented that. Jackson Pollock. More. Pollock, all of, these, all of these artists. So in terms of, like, being a black artist, like, this is, I, I had a, uh, this guy who was white in, uh, in my studio. The, I have a live work studio near downtown. He came to me and he said, you know, this is a great time for black artists. And mm -hmm. art is the best time. And I, and I wanted to, like, curse him out because... You know, I think in his mind, he's 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 equating, uh, you know, visibility with power, and that's not, to me, in my mind, a reality, right? Mm -hmm. Because when you look at something like the highest paid living artist today, his name is Jeff Koons. Okay, God bless him and everything, but his paintings are going for something upwards of like sixty five million. Wow. Not his paintings, but his works. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes he does sculpture, and. 
this is a white man. And to me, you know, I won't disrespect because one day I might meet him. Right. But, you know, uh, artists like, uh, let's just say, Kerry James Marshall, mm -hmm. who's been practicing around the same time and whose work is phenomenal, is barely scraping that at all you know it's great for let's just put it into perspective he's not doing bad at all he's not doing bad at all like what his last painting he sold to diddy like 20 million 20 bucks. million mm -hmm. which he didn't get a dime of right you know because uh he sold that piece actually in 19 i think it was 1977 if i'm wrong just correct me but 1977 he sold that i think for twenty thousand mm. dollars so you know, but the way the way that system works is once you're blown up, you may like me, I may sell a bunch of paintings for ten thousand to fifteen, twenty, whatever it is, but once I'm blown up, my 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 worth has Goes now up, went right. up there. You know, so now you can sell paintings for more money. Exactly. And those paintings become more valuable and all that stuff like that. Yeah. Talk about specifically what it the the plight or the experience of the black artist and the reason why I say that is because when we start talking about black artists in history, obviously, people know Basquiat. Mm -hmm. um, people know people, you know, some others. But it doesn't seem like, even for me, someone who has a little bit of knowledge about the art world, that I can go as deep uh, into my bag of black painters and sculptors and artists right. as I can with just some of the other guys that dominate these, pop these, culture. These, yeah, these uh, household names. Or household names. Like, what is that? Is that changing? Is there, is there something It's definitely, you know what, it is that I understand what the man who told me that it's great to be a black artist. Now, mm -hmm. what he was saying, there is the, mo this is a moment where we are, vo we are at the, at the forefront, you know, mm -hmm. um, in terms of what I see is that there is a problem still, and that is that only a few or one or two of us are let in, and then that creates a certain competition w among us, you know. Um, recently, you know, Nathaniel Mary Quinn, I don't know if you uh, saw about him, but he I think he was on Colbert's show and everything, but mm -hmm. he was signed by uh, Gagosian, which is like the height of the art world when you get in there. You know, his stuff is six figures now. Mm -hmm. And he's a younger brother, you know, he's like, I think he's from Chicago, actually. Mm -hmm. And his stuff is amazing, his work is amazing. But, you know, like I've ever overheard other artists, black artists, and they're like, man, shit ain't nothing, you know, this and that. Mm -hmm. And it was like, <sighs> I know what you, their, their voice and frustration, because they're like, why him only, yeah. you know? So that's playing against... It's like that in Hollywood for a long time, a lot, a, a, right. for a long time. If and that's changing to a degree too for a long time, if there was a big movie that was coming out and they needed a black face, it was Denzel, Will, and then a, a couple other guys, and there was a lot of actors that came around ninety seven to like two thousand five, two thousand six. Mm -hmm. After a while, they were frustrated with the fact that there didn't seem to be as deep a roster as far as leading men. It just didn't seem to be as deep a roster. Now that's that's definitely changing. Now right. you got five, six, seven guys that are on their come up right now. Right. And you're saying that we're the art world's a little bit behind maybe that right now. Yeah. But it's experiencing it like so I'm gonna give a shout out to my sister, uh, Miriam Ibrahim. Uh she she just opened a gallery in Chicago. She's big shit right now. Mm -hmm. And it's because she's repping some of the most exciting black artists that are on the scene. And she started in Seattle. Okay, she's Somali, but she started in Seattle, and it was like no black art there, mm -hmm. none, no representation. She kind of made that into a mecca. So now she's moved to Chicago. So it's like one step, one step, one step, and she's being taken seriously. Um, but you know, I mean, I don't want to get, uh, I don't want to speak, you know, just recklessly, but I will say that ownership is really important. And I bring up Miriam to say that, that she owns this gallery and she's changing things herself. If anybody's out there, look up Miriam Ibrahim. She reps, she might want to, yeah. You know, no? yeah, okay. hey, she's she's amazing. Right. And um, I just think when you talk about Hollywood, it's like, it's you know, people talk about, I hear like Jermaine Dupree and Jay-Z and everybody talk about this ownership thing as this is this, as if it's this mystified thing when it's really not that 
demystify. You know, it's, yeah. when you demystify it, it's just like you you're on your grind. Let's say you have resources, you start small, you get a little bigger, you just own, you keep going. Like right now, I'm a self-contained business. Mm-hmm. Right now, I'm I'm currently unsigned. Mm-hmm. Right, which is um. It's the same as in rap, right. right? Let's just say that you hot, but you are remaining unsigned. Mm-hmm. There can be power in that because, you know, I don't, like, the gallery galleries take a 50% commission. So when you say signed, yeah. you mean signed to a gallery? To a gallery. You could be signed to multiple galleries. Okay. Galleries take 50% commission. And most people, they say 50%. You know, you wasn't in the gym and all of this yeah, stuff. Yeah. But when you look at it, uh, once you sign with a reputable gallery, it has to be the right gallery, then they're going to do a lot of things for you. You know, there's, there's the press, there's obviously the logistics and everything, but they're going to be out there getting you more and raising your value. So 50, 50% of $2 million don't sound too bad. No, not at all. At all. Right. So, you know, that's the ecosystem of the of the art world. And what we need to have are more uh, black people who people who are of color mm-hmm. on museum boards and um also just more owners. Yeah, the ownership thing yeah. as far as black Americans is concerned is an interesting thing because it seems as if it's a new concept but it's not. I think that you know, black people um in the past we actually got talked out of ownership. Like we started off um after slavery really leaning into ownership and, right. and, and and you know starting our own businesses and owning things in our own community and I think around the time of integration uh, in some kind of way either a conversation was had with us or we had it with ourselves to where um, the renting uh, of our culture and ourselves and our talent the leasing of it to people and stuff like that became a big deal you wanted to get signed by a big deal you wanted to endorse you wanted to draw money from something that you didn't own so that it was it, it wasn't necessary for you to have as much exposure. Well that goes straight up back to the slave mentality, mm-hmm. which is I was at Master's house last night and y'all asses was out here in the field. Right. You know, you like, yeah. damn, no, that voice is fucked up. But you know, like it, it is what it is. You know, I see it all the time. Like I, I was at one of my collectors uh had me and it he put me up in his place mm-hmm. and it was in a nice place. And there was a doorman, and this dude looked like uh, Uncle Ben's mixed with, you know, Django, the guy, Samuel Jackson yeah. and Django. Yeah. And as soon as I pull up, what you doing up here? You Steven. ain't going to. Steven from Django. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was, what y'all do? What you doing? You can't, you can't do that. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, whoa. You right. know, so I say, I'm supposed to be here. You know, yeah. like I'm, I'm staying here. Yeah. And. <laughs> And I'm yeah, like, yeah. you know, it's that old school, I get it. you know, and I was just like, and it hurt me so bad because I was like, you know, I understand. Trust me, I understand. That man's probably been working there for 40 years and mm-hmm. he see this young dude roll up and I'm going to the penthouse. Mm-hmm. But I felt like, man, I'm over that. Like, at least like say good for you, young blood, like whatever. Yeah, I don't but his know. worth is in telling you that you can't be there. What's yeah, his worth, like his worth. It's like and I have the keys. It's, it's it's almost like sometimes what happens. We talk about racism in the police department. Um, it's really not as much black versus white as is blue versus white. Um, and the the reason why I say that is because a lot of the black cops uh, have a very similar mentality to their their white counterparts. And it's because in order to be accepted in that world, you have to look that they're there to tell people who the criminals are and it doesn't even who is they they the like a lot of black police officers mm-hmm. um have oh so they are the style makers or trendsetters well to me it? well to me when you get into like and listen a lot of black yeah. cops are going to listen to this and i've been trying to get one to come on the podcast so we can talk these things out but sometimes they even go harder because in order for them to prove their worth they have to, to disassociate yeah and tell yeah. their brethren um, who the criminals are and how they act and how they do whatever. And even if they don't have to be active in that, they have to ignore it. So the gentleman that was being the doorman there, uh, he, like his worth in part is in identifying for the rest of those people. Dangerous black dangerous people. Dangerous black people. Right. Um, and that brother's been doing that for a long, long time. And I think the goal is um, for us culturally is to 
live in a situation where no one has to be that. Where there's where there's so much there's so much value and so much strength and power in our own community in our own circles that no one feels like they have to compromise themselves, step out of that, and culturally or socially betray that in order to have a job somewhere. And so that that's a hard thing to do um, because there's such an – when you look at capitalism and the way that capitalism has been taught as being the saving grace of black America, there's an individualistic nature to it. Hmm. So it like everybody, you know, we even talk about guys in their hood that might be dealing dope. Mm -hmm. It's bad for the hood. I don't give a fuck. Like I know that like you're out there. I know that you're out there and you're you're doing what you have to do and you're participating in the economy that is available to you. And I'm not knocking anyone. No, fuck that. I am knocking it. Like I'm, I'm knocking it because. But you have to have. I'm, I'm go ahead. No, no, go for it. What are you gonna no, interject? you have to. You have to have a solution for that. Because like what Tupac said long ago, he said, how am I going to tell another person how they should operate if I'm not going to feed him? You get what I'm saying? Okay. Well, I mean, fair, so, fair enough. Fair enough. I mean, the options, I mean, I'm coming from that. I'm coming from, I'm coming from crack, the straight up crack era where I remember I sold crack for three days. Right. And I couldn't stomach it. You know, yeah. like, I, the but even though I was not selling crack, all of my... Friends was a lot of my friends were selling crack. Some, you know, most of my friends were selling crack. And there was uh, the police. What they would do is they would pull us over constantly. That's regardless if you're selling crack or not, because you're black and you're out here. What are you doing? What are you doing on earth? You're not supposed to move. You're not supposed to be anywhere. Mm -hmm. So what that culminated to is basically them pulling you into a alley. Or a restaurant bathroom and going in your asshole mm -hmm. with gloves. Okay, right. the most kind of is a demeaning thing to any any sure. person, you know. Uh, so planting drugs constantly, right? So what I noticed was that all of these friends, all of my I saw them as my friends. They're not like menaces to society or super predators, as the Clintons would put it. They were my friends. They're totally normal guys. Right. They were my friends and they were impoverished because I was impoverished. Mm -hmm. And I saw most of them never made, they only made enough money to buy some sneakers. Mm -hmm. Some sneakers and some food, maybe an Italian beef sandwich or a, a, or a hamburger. Then once they re up, they re up that eight ball or that half or whatever that they're doing, then they have enough to buy a shirt. But my, by this time, now the, the shoes. Are old, mm -hmm. so they never get a matching ax, uh, outfit because mm -hmm. it's always just catching playing playing catch up. Now, where is the property? Where is the rent? Where is it? who knows? Because that's like that's secondary. So when we talk about like survival, it's it's coupled with this conversation of ownership, right? Mm -hmm. Ownership. Well, you can't. You, ownership is impossible if you're living in a survival matrix because exactly. people that are surviving are living the minutes. I get the listen. Part of Part of changing the mindset, part of changing the sort of intellectual understanding of society that our community would have is getting us out of a matrix to where we're thinking about living or dying, to where we're thinking about just how do I make it to the next day? Because if that's the case, that has nothing to do. Anyone who's in a survival mode, who's just thinking about, I'm just trying to live to see the but next day. But this goes back to what do, you just said, they'll though. Do anything. But you my point, said, I do blame the drug. But, not blame the drug. You but, was like, but, I hold you re accountable. But the reality is this, though. At the same time, b understanding something mm -hmm. is different than condoning something. And criticizing something is different than dehumanizing an individual. This is I, true. Like, I know, like, it's a very difficult conversation to have from people that would be outside of my community. Mm -hmm. I know gentlemen criminals. Mm -hmm. I know dudes that are that are good people, that that have big hearts, that love, that, like, a lot of them. I know guys that I had lost that when they passed away, the entire hood was destroyed, right? Right. It sounds like Gambino for right. the Italians. Right. Like, like the, the, we were all sad that they were gone. But if you look at the rap sheet, you would think that this was a horrible, horrible person. Well, it depends on what lens you're looking at. It, it depends. On, I'm looking at you as a fucking dude. Right. I'm looking at you as a guy. Yeah. Like I'm not like, and and so I'm not saying that we necessarily have to judge human beings for the situations that they find themselves in, but the actions and 
they're right or wrong. And what I and 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 and, and what I would say is, not only do I come from a family of drug dealers, I come from a family of drug users. users. Exactly. And so when you see somebody that's chained to that and cannot beat that. Do you dr- do die. you blame the drug dealer though, or do you blame the real drug dealer? I bl- no, I don't blame the drug. I, I don't blame the drug dealer. What I want the middleman, I should the, say. No, I don't blame. I don't listen. There's a lot of blame to go around from the top all the way down. But what I'm saying is, I want less of that, and I want you to know that I can't celebrate you doing that. I'm not gonna. Con- I'm not going to say, yo, you're a terrible, bad individual. <laughs> but that's what rap that. is. What? But but I think to, I, I think there's. I, listen, I think that's that, what rap is—a celebration of these people surviving by any I think, means necessary. Right. I think the rap. You know? I, I think rap is a celebration of their of them surviving. And a lot yeah. of times, when you when you, if we were if me and you were in if we had been in Hanoi together, right in Vietnam, okay, and we're like let's say I'll make you John McCain because you said you share his politics. So what? Let, 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 <laughs> let's say we have been okay. in Hanoi together, right? Right. If we have been in Hanoi together okay. and we both survive Hanoi, we come back, we all fucked up, we we walking with limps, whatever, whatever. You know what we would do whenever we got together? We would talk about in great detail how fucking difficult it was to make it out of there. We would have a bond that a lot of people wouldn't understand. We would be like, hey, remember that one fucking guy that used to come in and all the shit that we went through, mm-hmm. in hindsight, it would be terrible, but it would seem glossier in the fact that we had survived it. And we would tell that story of survival for a long time. Yeah. That, to me, is what hip-hop is. Yeah. I mean, but on a personal level, like, it's when you brought that up, I don't do that. I don't do Like, I find it... I think that I have... I, I don't think... I know I have some trauma mm-hmm. associated <laughs> with, um, with projects... And poverty and the crack era. Yeah. So, like, you know, when we talk about these Vietnam vets, like, I actually, like, most of my friends from back in the era, I don't even talk to them. And it's not because I'm acting new or extra Hollywood. It's just that I think that in order to do, to, to get out of that, and this is, I might get some flack for this. Mm-hmm. In order to get out of that, you have to get away from it, mm-hmm. you know? And that's one thing. Like, away from I, it or away from them? No, away from it, because okay. what what it is as human beings, like there was, they, they, we go back to childhood. They'll tell me some bullshit. They'd be like, because they used to call me some dumb shit when I was young. Mm-hmm. You know, like my nickname. I don't even want to tell you. Fuck, I'll tell What's you. What's your nickname? They call me Furry. Why? <laughs> it's Ferrari, and they just like Furry. Oh. You know, some high shit. People yeah, getting yeah, high, yeah, they yeah, like, yeah, yo, yeah. you Furry. You right, know, it's right. like whatever. But we share that where it's like, yo, that's dumb. Don't call me that, and then we fighting over it and yeah. all of that. I love them. You know, but where I am in my life, it just seemed that's I was looking at a tweet that it may be old by the time you um, put this out. But Ice-T said, you know, he peeped game, you know, and I follow him. I love him. I love Ice-T, man. But he was like, you know, having powerful enemies is good because it shows, it makes you strength. And I was thinking about him like, that's the last thing that Nipsey said, mm-hmm. you know, and I, I'll, I'll get moments where I'm like getting drunk and I'm thinking about him like I wish Nipsey would have not been so down earth. You understand? All right. So, you know, because of that and that I know you might have talked about this on your No, no, I haven't. So so okay. what you're saying is you're saying is you wish that because he might have not been at the marathon store that day. It's not they might not have been at the marathon. It's just that or the marathon store might have been somewhere else. Somewhere else because so I mean, I'm looking at this, you know, hip hop is my our baby, mm-hmm. you know, and this I, I told my before Nipsey died, I was like, you know what, I can't take another loss. Like this is starting, it hurts. Yeah. You know? So but I think about every almost everyone who, who, who we lost in hip hop, and it may expand even go to John Lennon or whatever. They were down to earth. And they're saying, I'm down to earth. Well, it's the same. Saying down to earth is the same thing as saying keeping it real. Right. You know? And you say, I'm going to keep it real and I'm going to do this shit. And I say, I'm I'm here to announce, fuck that. Like, at a certain point, I I wish all of those dudes I grew up well. Like, you know, like I hope that they, get, they can feed their families and they go forward. But I can't take them with me. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think that's an important message. You can't to, take them with you, but you don't have to leave them behind. You don't have to leave them behind because at a certain in a certain point, I'm always going to be vouching for like, vouch, right. you know, standing for them. But in terms of, you know, you said about the Vietnam vet, like 
I don't even want to think about those things because they traumatize me so much, you I know? It. Totally um, understand. So, you know, it's it's this weird thing about hip hop, man. Let me ask you this though, oh. real quick, before we move okay. on. Okay. So, so for me, just talking about that because that's a very important um, piece of information to kind of unpack. So this is so in my life, I look at influence and power as this, right? So being out here, having a, a specific voice, right? Having a voice that could, could potentially grow into a larger voice, yeah. What good is that voice if the kids from South Baton Rouge, Louisiana, who are going to be looking and saying, yo, Vans from right here, Vans from Gardier Lane, Van went to McKinley High School, Van's sister went to Lee High School, like the people from Gardier, from that, that, if I come out here and all of that, that happens and their lives aren't affected by that, to me, my life becomes somewhat of a waste. And the reason why... I would say that is because it's almost like the NBA is doing something right now called NBA Africa, right? Oh, and so, you know, I lived I lived in several yeah, countries in, in Africa, in Africa so, right? Yeah, so so what, what happens is Pascal Siakam, NBA player, comes from Cameroon. Mm -hmm. Comes from Cameroon. One player comes out of there. They get a couple of different players out of there, and then what happens is all the players – forget about what happens when a corporation inv invests into a situation. It's never great. But what happens is all the players that come from there that have dreams of being able to get to the NBA now, now because one guy made it out, they have a conduit. doesn't mean he has to go back and stay in Cameroon and live there. He can live in Toronto. He right. can live wherever. in L.A. Yeah. He can live with a, whatever, wherever. <laughs> but the time that he spends – going back and making sure that the next Pascal Siakam doesn't have such a hard road to get there changes everything. And I think that that's very important. I think so, That too. black Americans do that. It's not even just black Americans. Nah, I'm saying black Americans because the reason why I'm saying black Americans is because nobody else is coming to give us a fucking hand. And we've been trying to appeal to... Mainstream culture for a long time. We have been trying to say, yo, y'all treating us bad. Y'all don't do us right. Like that, They're never coming. That's, they don't give a fuck. They've, they've proven that over and over again. They don't care. It's not going to happen. And it's not even, it's not, might not even be for them to care. We just got to care about us. Mm -hmm. And part of that caring is not staying on your hood and in your block necessarily, but it's definitely making sure that people from your block got a chance that they might not have had, had you not blown up. I, I I totally agree. You know, one of my plans, I'm not blown up like that, but I will be. And I do have a plan, and that plan is to, you know, have a school. Mm -hmm. And in a school, you know, I would take at-risk students and also students who are doing great. And yeah, not just at risk. Sometimes, yeah. uh, No, but at risk because I was at risk. At I was risk really is important, at risk. But we also want to make sure that just kids that might come from two parent families that want to do art that they have exactly right. you have a you have right. a you have agency here as well yeah but what I will do is I will have them where they can travel because that's so important like you know when I went out of the country and I start going around like you start to have a better perspective of the world not saying we can't hit we can't we can't solve this mm -hmm. in one generation it's like trying to move a mountain in one sitting you can't do it right right so we're we have a great task ahead of us. And sometimes, I'll be honest to you, we, we talked off camera about Jay-Z. And I we had, um, for a minute, I was trying like about his NFL. We have went over this. This is old news by now. But I, I, what I was pressing for early on was a little patience, mm -hmm. right? And a little... Like with a two-year-old, not saying that this man is a two-year-old, <laughs> you know, but where we can say, okay, give him some leg room, uh, like we do Popeyes and like we do whoever. Be like, man, they get on. I fucked them. They did this and that. And then next next year, we like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hungry though. Yeah, you know, yeah. just give him some room. And I think that, you know, not that the, that the things we we have is just such a great fear. And it's and it's and it's and it's valid of being betrayed, you know, because we've been betrayed so many times, mm -hmm. right? But how many times have we been betrayed by America and, and white people, you know? And which like th these, th 
this whole thing is an experiment. When we even let's just bring this conversation first of all out of just America and make it into a diaspora mm -hmm. situation. Like all of my people in you know South Africa and Nigeria and Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, like we're all facing the same similar problems. I went to a conference in uh, Cape Town in 2012. Right. It was a conference that was actually funded. I didn't know it when I went. I was just like free airplane ticket. Let's talk about. Some stuff. Yeah. And yeah. I went. Yeah. But it was funded by David Soros. Mm -hmm. Right. And I didn't know that until I got to George Soros. Joro, David. I don't even know this guy's name. Yeah, That's yeah, how yeah. deep it is. Mm -hmm. Where I was like, what you want to talk about something? I feel like they had our rooms tapped. Because we had to answer these political questions in order to get onto the internet. Sure. It was like really weird or whatever. But at any rate, I'm in Cape Town. I was like free free flight to Cape Town. We have the these seminars where there are Africans from every from all the countries around Africa, and then there's you know a few people even from the states and from the UK. And we're having what essentially became a slave meeting. That's what I felt it was, where mm. we talked about our identity, what's holding us back, colonialism, slavery. And, you know, I looked over, I had a moment, and I looked over, and there was like a few, couple white people sprinkled in the audience, and they seemed to be taking notes, not even taking a bathroom break. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, this is theater. Right. This is theater. This has become theater. And... We're working through this in a pu very public way, which is uh, unique in a historic from a historic standpoint where there's a group of people who are slighted for for centuries. And instead of violence, because usually that's how it's, it's taken care of right. is violent, violent insurrection and defense. We now must assimilate and try to come up, strategize in the eyes of the people who are holding us back. Many of the people in our group, it's, 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 it's a lot to deal with. So when we're approaching, you know, some, someone like Jay-Z who has a little power right now, he has a little power. And when you look at the spectrum of how much power there is, and we're just hard on them. We hard on each other. We hard on our women. We hard on us. Like, and sometimes it's like, I'm, I'm Pisces and I'm sensitive, like they would say, but also sensitivity is not a weakness. Since it's a sensitive person to beat you to death. Right. But I'm sensitive to that because I know that that tough love doesn't work. It only works in, in reverse. Like, I know this from a per personal standpoint. Like, you know, that tough love, it makes you callous. It makes you callous. And it makes, let's just get back into the, the conversation we were talking about. It makes a person who wanted to help say, fuck y'all. And I've, I've, had, I've had those situations, like in terms of like when I, you know, came to social media, uh, it was like a prominence, I guess you want to call it. I didn't even take it seriously at the time. It's like, oh, you're Twitter famous. They used to get on my, ner my nerves because I'm like, no, I actually can paint masterpieces. Mm -hmm. So it's a disrespect. But now it's something to say you're social media famous, you mm -hmm. know. But at the time, I was social media famous. And I saw, like, I'll say some dumb shit. I was growing up in the public, not to give, you know, any, uh, you know, excuses Maybe or excuses, anything. Yeah. But it's like I was literally growing up, and there's some things that I read that I wrote that I that I tweeted like years ago, and I'm like, you are fucking stupid, dude. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you were also 23, <laughs> you know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So, but just the way you know, with the then we get into cancel culture. But that was this was the pre-cancer cancer culture. Cancel cancel culture. Mm -hmm. See, look at that. Yeah, look yeah. at that cancer culture. Yeah. Now cancel culture, yeah. where it's like. I'm looking at many of the, you know, the the faces in the in the Abbeys that are cursing me out and calling me less than shit and I ain't nothing and they're black. And I'm like, yo, I've I literally like I, I'm not gonna sit out here and put up my resume out here, but I've done things behind the scenes that are like for my people because I can't I couldn't sleep. I'm like, I need we need to do something. So for that to turn that quick into some like bullshit and then where it's like I'm dismissed completely dismissed i don't like that and i feel like that is also holding us back because there's a there's an element and not to compare my us to white america or white britain or whatever but i know something about this first of all whiteness is a construct 
Mm -hmm. You want to get into that, anybody who doesn't know, it was created. Whiteness was created, you know, up until after um, World War II, uh, let's just say Jews, Italians, and Irish weren't considered white. Okay? Yeah. So they were considered a little underneath white. Sure. So all this is changing, but white people, I've noticed, don't throw white people away. Okay? Let's look at these these uh, serial killers. Let's look at these mass shooters. Some of the worst people in history. They get a place. It may be at the bottom of whiteness. Even white, tr so-called white trash gets a place. And they say, well, he shot up a mall. He was insane. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're like, wow, the humanity is preserved. It's not that he's a monster. They call, they call it. Uh, There's the, a reason for all of this. Yeah. The, the reason is that, um, and this is something that black people have to get away from. Really, a lot of people have to get away from. There's a belief, and the belief bears itself out in society, that white people are good and black people are bad. Okay? So it's very simple. It's a simple belief. Uh, this was broken down so eloquently by Orlando Jones in a monologue he did on a show called American Gods, where he talked about, he, he plays um, the god of, essentially, black people, a Nigerian god on the show, and he was like, you know, when dealing with these things, anytime a white person does something that's, no matter how terrible it is, um, it's looked at, as, looked at as a good person who did a bad thing. Mm. When um, mm. a black person does something, it's them showing you who they really were the entire time. time. And so, not only do I feel like mainstream America believes that, I feel like to a degree, and it's lessening, but... To a degree, we believe that we believe that of ourselves sometimes, and the mm. the reason is because we see um, a lot of ugliness, and the ugliness that we see sometimes comes from one another. Also, though, we are we're more forgiving of each other behind the scenes than we are in public. Hmm. That is the most concerning thing to me, because that tells me that we act differently um, while under the gaze of white America. Right, we're the, expected to go into this gladiator or, phase. Right, or because mode. the reality is that when you see all of these people uh, on the internet that are, um, that are, that are lambasting and talking about, these are people that have in their families and in their communities all types of people that they put up with fuck shit from forever right like like we all know fucked up people that's in our family fucked up people that's this fucked up friends fucked up like like all of this stuff right right, right. and but when it when it comes from a celebrity or somebody prominent we want to act like they're the the um exception or this thing or they that the, the 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 status that they've attained and someone make in some way makes them impervious to having made a mistake or just been being wrong about something right so and then I think to a degree, I got to look at myself and I say, I'm guilty of that. Not just with black people, but, you know, uh, you, you come hard at people. Yeah, you do. You come like people. You know how many people have called me up? Be like, yo, man, I'm not going to name no names. Yo, man, what's Ferrari fucking problem with me? I just like I just be like, yo, man, Ferrari got a warrior spirit. He just because, you know, because you get on Twitter, yeah. and you're not afraid to name. I names. mean, and at the end of the day, it's like I won't <laughs> unless I take it back because I, I did. I'm, I'm going to name. Can I name a name? Go for it. Charlemagne the God. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to name a name. I'm sorry. I apologize, brother. You know, there were some times where I wanted to correct him and I could have went about it a different way. Mm -hmm. And I did take the fuckboy stance, which is I'm going to come at you. And it was some real shit. Like, I'm actually from that culture where if you got a problem with somebody, you handle it. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? But we also are grown men, and we are trying. I, I see, like, I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't apologize right now mm -hmm. if I had not seen him trying to, you know, to move in a different direction than Black what he. Man, doing his best, bro. Right, he's doing his best, and I saw, I saw. I used to be like, what my criti my criticism of him was. I said, you, you have this platform, this large platform, and you're not using it properly. Not to say that I would do any better, but I'm like, you know, with. The uh, it just seemed like he there was there was a, there was a spirit of har not harassment, 
talking the shit. Show. Talking the shit, no, no, man. And I know that's entertainment, but I was yeah. like, I'm coming from like I had, I had. We talk about what you had, but I no longer do it because I'm doing something else. I, I, I had a platform of my own, in uh, independent. Stop being famous, and part of the thing that made that popular was that I humanized my guests. Mm-hmm. And that's what I wanted for him to do so badly because I felt there was so much to to learn from the people instead of just, you know, doing, like you said, we're expected to go into this gladiator arena. And so I heard that you suck some dick. You know, it's just yeah. like, come on, bro. Like, what? you know, like, don't do that. I know you're better than that. And I'm starting to see him move where he'll actually, like, ask, you know, in terms of, like, colorism and things like that. He'll ask someone, like, what does this mean? Help me through this because I'm I'm learning. Mm-hmm. How can you be mad? How can you be upset with a person like that? Right. You get what I mean? But again, that was me being on some fuck shit not actually seeing his his humanity because at the moment I was like, this is what you represent. You represent some dumb shit right now. Right. So this is what you are. Charlemagne, dumb shit. Dumb shit. And that's not true because he got mom and go home. You know, he's learning. And I saw that. Mm -hmm. I saw that. Other people... I'm going to be honest with you. And I'm I'm better with this because I actually learned a lesson the other night and I'll tell you about. These trolls who be talking that shit, I go into their DMs quietly and I, I asked them f- for a physical altercation <laughs> and I'm not the baddest person in the world I had right, my ass beat right. before so, I didn't got my ass beat I didn't beat some ass but I didn't have my ass beat my thing is so you, if you so, have, if somebody you, if trolls you, think, you and you go straight up and you like let's if fight. it's a man if it's a man right then I'm gonna say well I asked them well what's your problem with me mm-hmm. like what is seriously what's your problem and then when they say, they say, no, you just said something, then it's cool. I'm disarmed. But I be really, I want to know if you really have a problem with me because right now you're harassing me and I don't like that. And I guess I'm not new school enough. Like I come from a school of you. If you have a problem with someone, you talk shit to a stranger, you might end up in a cemetery. Right. Like keep that level of, I'm, I was talking to Vic, Vic Mensa. I took, I was the first person to take Vic Mensa to the gun range right. right he asked me to take him I took him first thing he said was like you know he noticed there was at, not to put his name out there but fuck it it is what it is there was a confederate flag on the wall at this gun range that we went to and he went off he went off he went to the to the owner he like yo why y'all got that up this and I had to grab him I'm like don't do that don't do that we're all armed in here and if you notice everyone's respectful Mm-hmm. <laughs> like super people like excuse me hi well, this right, is no problem blah right. blah blah it's everybody is equally armed we right. respect each other but somehow because I was talking I was having a conversation about this because if something goes left it can go all the way left all the way left everybody's hurt everybody's in loss their family's in loss so on the internet you know and I know uh, the, the, like you know the, the saying is either you're gonna change the world or the, you're gonna be changed by the world I'm not gonna change the internet the internet is full of trolling it won't stop you know, but sometimes as a cathartic release for myself, mm-hmm. I need to address these people and say, we need to get back to respect, to respect. What and happens that's why- though the one time you go, yo, you're trying to pull up and it goes, yeah, nigga, right. what's popping now? I'm that, I'm down. Like, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm not even, I'm not, I'm not fucking with you. Like, I mean, right. I have so much to lose right now and I'm, that's why I'm changing because it's like, Ferrari, you made it out of that. You don't got to do that no more. And this and that. And I need to probably, um, this is what's not probably, I need to actually get off. Most of that used to tell me, they'd be like, Ferrari, you need to get off of the internet and this and that. Because he ain't doing that shit right. at all. Get off the internet. You be telling Kanye the same thing and you don't listen. But get off the internet. And I'm getting it to a point now where it's, I, I'm, starting, I'm starting to have more to lose. Right. And, you know, that's just dumb shit. It's just dumb shit. But at the same time, most of those cases, what I find out is that these people don't mean any harm. Mm-hmm. And that they're not actually threatening me or whatever. It's just that this is what this environment breeds, where it's just like, fuck you. I got people who don't like me. And have never had a conversation with me or never saw me in person or even seen like how I speak. It's like wildfire, wildfire, this catch on fuck Ferrari Chef. Fuck is like uh, with Tyler when he was like, fuck Steve Harvey. We yeah. didn't even know what the fuck he was saying. Right. Stuff, fuck Steve Harvey for. Steve Harvey gave us a reason later, but you know. Right, right, right. Ah. <laughs> how, so let me ask you this. We're talking right now. It's Monday. 
Kanye was supposed to have dropped Friday. You're from right. Chicago. Yeah. You're cool with Chance. You know a lot of people. How, what are your feelings about Kanye West right now? Kanye. I love Kanye, man. I love Kanye, but I'm not his fan anymore. And that's just the honest truth. Um, I can't, I, I, it's hard for me to be be a person, because I'll say some wild shit. Expect me to do some wild shit in life. Just anybody out there, I may do some wild shit, but there are certain things within my parameter that I would never do. And I think that if you're a leader, right, you have to be, you have to have qualities that are of a leader. Right now, he is not in this, in a in a state where he can lead, man. Like, and it's not just because of his bipolar disorder or alleged part bipolar disorder. It's that, you know, I don't think that he's centered spiritually. You get what I mean? So I'm just kind of out of it. I just, I mourn, I mourn that dude because I felt that energy where he was the, he, who doesn't feel that energy where you the underdog? Everybody said you was never going to do it. You did it. You took over the world. This dude, like Kanye West, at a certain point was the hardest thing, you know, when he had that wait till I get my money, yeah. right? It was so beautiful to see him blossom in his genius and for it to fizzle in a moment in this in these studios here, mm -hmm. you know, and for it to turn into this, like, I don't know if you're trying to be a cult leader or if you're trying to, like, I know you love Jesus. He loved Jesus, like, for real. That's no faking yeah. that. But I also know that if, you, if you're bipolar, then there are moments where a lot, some bipolar people experience this great feeling of religious awakening. Mm -hmm. Also, they feel that they can save the world. You know, I think there was a brother. I won't won't take credit for this. There was a brother. I forget who wrote about this. Or wrote about Kanye and his and, and bipolar disorder. And he was also himself bipolar. Mm -hmm. And he was saying how he felt like sometimes he could save the world in that moment where he split the, at, at Lollapalooza, where he said, "Let me through. This is my city." He split like oh, like you know um, like Moses. Moses. Mm -hmm. That was a kind of manifestation of that thing of like I have this great sense of I can save people. Right. So I don't relate to it anymore. I don't relate to it. And uh, my criticism, of him, I, I, don't, I don't have contact with him anymore or none of that. But um, I have problems with him that, you know, I could discuss them here, but they could be discussed privately, too. Yeah. But mainly Vanessa B. Cross, she deserves to be called out by name. This woman, if you don't know about her, Google Vanessa B. Croft, Sudan. And this is a woman who works with Kanye West. She uh, went to, 10 years ago this was, she went to Sudan and she tried to adopt these two Sudanese twins, okay, from an orphanage, but only for a photo shoot. And she filmed it and the nurses there were telling her, please don't touch the babies. And she snatched the babies. This is in her documentary called Art Star. She snatched the babies and she she went and she was crying and she started calling the women names and, you know, racist names, okay? And saying how they were selfish and this and that. And all she wanted to do was adopt these babies for a photo shoot in which she has we these two adopt children. adopt them for a photo shoot, like for, take full take, legal custody of them. Take them just to have this photo of them breastfeeding from her and it's on the internet then she goes on to say that kanye west gave her permission to say the n-word and that she identifies her so she's a white person with ginger hair as a black male because kanye things like this is you can read about it read up on vanessa b cross nah, tell me finish telling me i never heard this before so like what is what is like what? she she vanessa b cross works works with him on um the the his his fashion campaign she did the she did the aesthetics for the video of runaway mm -hmm. okay very very um talented artist without a doubt she's in some of the highest art galleries in the world it's just that her blatant racism and she says some things about beyonce you have to read about those that are clearly a problem and for Kanye to just go through with tunnel vision and act like this isn't happening, it kind of goes into his whole, I don't want to talk about this dude for 30 minutes, but I love him. When I say I love him, I mean that I love him. He's going through some problems. I have some disagreements. 
I'm sure Kwali and a whole bunch of other people who know him, even Yassin and everybody has talked to him. And yeah. we don't know. We just don't know. But I love him in that same fort because I fell in love with him when he had that, when I when he showed me his brilliance. Right, right now he's in a moment where he's down. So I won't kick him anymore when he's down. I stopped that. Right. You know? Right. And that's where we are. So last question I'll ask you. As an artist, like a full service artist, meaning full service, paint, you do music, all of that. Yeah. There's an argument or a discussion about the artist's responsibility to the community and their responsibility to themselves. Mm -hmm. How? Where do you stand on that? Now, is art now, and a man in his middle thirties or whatever, mm -hmm. I think is is very it's, it's important. It is uh, monumental. To put yourself first, to put your, your your mental health, your physical health, your financial health first, because I was one of those before the art. No, before the, I thought we were talking about the people. Oh, okay, or, the, okay, before the people. Okay, put okay. yourself first. Okay. No, the art, art first is you. Art is me, man. Like whether because there's been times where you know I'm in survival mode. Like I was homeless, man, in um in New York City. I was sleeping. Shout out to everybody who let me sleep on their floors. I'm not there anymore, but thank you. Uh, I'm humble enough to say that to the point where it's just like sometimes we don't have. We need help. You know, the community needs to help us. Um, but I, even then, I was an artist. I'm always an artist, no matter what. Whether I'm selling or I'm not selling, I'm always going to be an artist. But when it comes down to, uh, I think that question goes more to a rapper or something because you say, well, what do you do? You put the people before the art? Or what was the question again? The I'm question like, is, um, is anything done in the name of art appropriate? Oh, see, I misunderstood. You can okay. just clip that out. Yeah. Hell no. Nah. Because, first of all, Hitler, Adolf Hitler, had a whole unit of people who specialized in creating propaganda art that would ultimately uh, lead to the genocide, or well, not genocide, but the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. Okay? So there are instances where art is not fucking art. It's actually just hatred. You get what I mean? So, uh, you know, who's to determine that? I don't know who's to determine it. It's just like we know by the results of it, you know? Um, I, I've seen so many... There's, oh, I don't want to get into that little shit. Yeah, I've seen artists, visual artists, who they're white... And they are uh, pushing the lines of what they can do as a white person in terms of w what expression they have in telling black people stories. But I've also, like, I have a friend from college, this dude, he's like an Irish dude, I love him forever. Uh, he's not from Ireland, he's just white, a white man. Right. And he called me, and he, shout out Steven, because he might see this shit. He called me and he asked me, he said, you know, sometimes you'll have white people who think that you're the king of black people. Yeah, <laughs> and they're like, so yeah, they're yeah. like, do you think that this is bad for yeah. whatever? And I had to tell him, I'm like, I can't tell you what everybody else is going to say, but I can tell you what I think about it. He has this great idea about the, um, the school bombing of the, of the girls in uh, 63. Four little girls. Yeah, four little girls. And. He had this idea. He's like, man, yo, I want to go down. And I want to talk to the families that actually were involved in that. And so I was like, go, go, because you're coming from a pure place. He was like, do you think I'll get backlash because I'm a white person? I'm like, no, you're coming from a respectful place. You can't ever, like, even if it is mistaken for something that's disrespectful, it exists in a very intelligent way, in a thoughtful, thoughtful way. Like, we don't look at uh, David Attenborough him covering some area and be like, man, what the fuck you doing over there messing with them? And you're like, yeah. no, this dude is, he's trying to give us a better understanding of the world. Right. So you can never be out of pocket. So great art shines through that you don't have, there's no explanation that's needed. Like people may not like me, they may not like things that I've said, but when they look at my paintings, they have to just shut the fuck up because it's not even me. It's not coming from me. It's art now. It's a documentation, something that exists outside. 
personality, race, this and that. Right. So I think that that's important to understand when it comes to art. Like we won't have to question whether what is this art or trash. It's like you no know, fucking trash, man. Right. You know. Uh, so yeah, that's what I feel about that. Give it up for Four Iron Shepherd, you guys. Clap. Thank Clap. you. Thank you. All right. This is this energy healing. Energy healing is the thing. Why? She, she, she like, yo, don't put no, me on I was this gonna, You know, but I, was, I didn't know you was going to bring your girl because I was going to ask you whether or not, we'll talk about that when she's not here one time, if there were art groupies. Art groupies? Yeah. No, she could tell, you could talk to me about that. No, no. Yeah. No, you say that now. <laughs> and then we talk about art groupies. Man. And then later on. She'd be like, what's up with the she, like, She's doing some energy healing or something like that. She goes, you know, after I'm <laughs> I just want to have just a. A small conversation about these art groupies. Just, <laughs> I want to know where they are. Right. Uh, but we'll talk about that. No, there's no art we'll, No, no, that, no. Nah, yeah, yeah, you know it's art groupies. All right, we'll talk about that over text. All right, peace out. You guys, we have real black woman magic in here. Yeah. Give it up for Sharice. Woo-hoo. Give it up for Clap Loud hey. White People. Just, you don't have to clap. <laughs> She well, we looks a little white. white. So it's, Cherie, it's Rhodes, right? <laughs> yes. Sharice Rhodes. Now, t- so to tell the, the listeners of the Red Pill who you are. I am Sharice Rhodes. I am also running for a local seat in office, Los Angeles County Board of Supervisor. Los Angeles County Board of Supervisor. Yes. Now, I thought it was very important to have you on because of a couple of things. Number one, um, in the black community, we talk about uh, being politically active. We talk mm-hmm. about being politically engaged. But a lot of times when we do that, uh, we talk about national elections. Mm-hmm. It's, we get people galvanized behind presidential elections, sometimes gubernatorial elections, mm-hmm. sometimes senatorial elections. Uh, but we don't talk about what we need to do in our state and local governments in order to make change in our communities. Absolutely. Now, before we get into why you felt like it was important to run, mm-hmm. I want you to tell people a little bit about your background, where you're from, um, and how you got to where you are now. I'm from L.A. Mm-hmm. My background, I was a former foster youth. Um, I was uh, also I experienced homelessness in L.A. County mm-hmm. with my three-year-old son. I used the welfare programs. And so um, during those experiences, I became pissed off. Mm. Pissed off to the point where I'm not happy the way my community is, the way it's being uh, uh, ran. I'm not happy with local government. Um, Just like you mentioned about how a lot of times we're focused on presidential elections, but little do we know that our local government is what affects our day to day lives. Right. And what's being administered into our counties, into our, you know, our, our council districts. So. That's even highly more uh, important to be a part of that process as far as who we're voting in locally, Mm -hmm. because that's affecting our immediate day to day uh, uh, lives. Mm -hmm. So that was one reason I got fed up with the system. I got fed up with over decades, how many people are more becoming homeless every day. Mm -hmm. I'm fed up with how many of our young black boys are um, being killed. Yeah. And no accountability taken. And I just got pissed off and I said, hey, I need to stand up for my community so that we can be represented because right now we're being overlooked. So tell tell us about the, the journey that going from being homeless with your son mm-hmm. to being in a position to run for a public office. That's an amazing story. Wow. So... I wanted to get my feet wet, which uh, which was uh, 2018. I was homeless mm-hmm. with my wow, three year old so son. Recent. That was last year. And I was sitting there. I'm like, what can I do to change the situation? I'm in a county. I'm in a county building. And there's a lady that came in the county building with her five year old baby, infant baby is raining that day. And she's like, um, you guys stop my benefits. Right. And and they're like, well, you didn't turn in a piece of paper. She's like, I came all the way down here to give you a piece of paper that you've already got. I came in on the bus and, you know, it's like, I just need help. Like, we just need help. And and they're like, oh, we do have the paper. And they didn't do their job, but she had to, her baby's sick. She had to come all the way down in this count, to this county uh, building just to get something to move forward so she can feed her baby. Right, and it, and it I'm turned lo- out to be a clerical error. And, and I'm looking around the room, Van, mm-hmm. and it's Latino women, it's black with, with tears in their eyes, how how much she's just like, we just need help. Mm-hmm. Like, 
what's going on here? Where are the resources? How come the resources are like trying to find a needle in a haystack? Yeah. And um, I guess just from that, it's just like somebody had to stand up. Right. And you decided that person was you. What was that like? So you 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 see this going on and then you decide I want to do something. What's the first thing that you start? So doing? what I started doing, I start looking up who's accountable for this. What are the seats in office? What does this seat do? What does that seat do? And I came across the county board of supervisors, which we're not. We know about our city councils, men and different things like that. But we're not too, you know, hip on what's the county board of supervisors. Yeah, I don't even know what that is. Exactly. They're they're pretty much referred to as the kings and queens of the L.A. County. Mm -hmm. That's how powerful they are. They administer the funding into our LAPD, into our fire departments, into our county programs. Anything that is uh, local government is the L.A. County Board of Supervisors supervise that. They're right over the council districts. Check writers. Check writers. Hmm. The much, movers and shakers. How much representation um, in terms of African Americans do we have on there right now? One person. Out of how many? Out of five. Hmm. So one person out of five are, are these. And so for the board of supervisors, is this broken up into specific districts? In specific districts. Okay. Overall, uh, the entire district is made up of about 10 million people. Mm -hmm. Each district is about 2.5 million. Wow. So yes. if you're one person, then you have a tremendous amount of, of power. You're it's as big as a state. Mm. Yes. Wow. Um, so, okay. So you, so then the reality is that you took on, would this be your first elected office? This would be my first elected office. So you took on a pretty, I don't know, sizable challenge in going Absol for this. Absolutely. It's a powerful position. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So when I was talking about getting my feet wet, then when I, I so as I'm looking at what, uh, uh, what seats to run for, uh, at the time, this seat wasn't available. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, hey, let me run for state assembly. This was in 2018. I'm still homeless, mind you. Right. So I'm sitting there trying to figure out how to do the paperwork, sit it, standing in grocery parking lots, getting signatures. You have to get a certain amount of signatures. And so, you know, it got to a point where um, where uh, I was uh, uh, I was on paper as a candidate, but I was blocked to a point where I couldn't actually run that time. Right. But I got that kind of foundation of experience on running. Right. And um, so I was I was still trying to do that, being homeless at the same time. Mm. It was no. OK, let me wait till I get this point of my life. It was a mindset of let me just go and do it. Work. And so here I am today. And from my experience from 2018 to now, it's like you have to create allies. You have to um, know what your platform is. And one of my main things is incorporating our influencers like yourself mm -hmm. um, to inspire the youngsters and our hip hop culture. Our culture period is powerful. Mm -hmm. And so in our communities, our, our, young, our youth are following the influencers. Mm -hmm. They're not following the elected officials. Mm -hmm. It's important to give our influencers political power because that is you guys are the leaders of our future. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that's wise? And this is why I'll ask this. Sometimes something that frustrates is like me. Um, influencers tend to be influenced mm -hmm. a lot by the uh, sort of echo chambers that exist online. Mm -hmm. Like it's sometimes difficult to actually uh, get in a room with people and get any real coalition building done because the people that support you online, the people that look at you they're so loyal to what they what it is that they think that you are that they don't allow you to step outside the box mm -hmm. the thing that i like about having someone like you is as an election as an elected official is you have the opportunity to actually influence the influences absolutely see i i, I would rather not have you give me power mm -hmm. i would rather take that power mm -hmm. and give it to you Mm -hmm. And give it to people who are working in communities that are doing this every single day. Because I'm going to be honest with you. I sit on television and then I talk shit and I laugh and I do a podcast and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I wasn't standing in a parking lot getting signatures. Mm -hmm. I wasn't on the ground. I wasn't in that building. I wasn't doing that work. You were. Mm -hmm. Like you're the person that knows how this works. You're the person that has this information. So it's actually up to people like me 
to make sure that people like you have what you need. And and that's working together because mm-hmm. it's not just about me. Right. It's about both of us like a coalition yeah. working together. You have your influence. People look up to you a certain way. You can say something and people will start doing that in their lives. Right. I have a different type of influence, like you said, maybe over the influencers. I, I would say equal. Mm-hmm. And so me using my, my power and you using your power and your influence, working that together, it, it's a force. Right. Right. Tell, tell us a little bit about your early life, though, because there's got to be something in you that yes. made you decide um, to take up this challenge when really you weren't in a position to actually do mm-hmm. it. Like, mm-hmm. tell, tell us about, like, you prior to that. Like, what, mm-hmm. what did you go through in your life? Like, mm-hmm. who, who are you? Who is you? So um, just a little family history. My great grandfather, George Rhodes, he was the musical director for Sammy Davis Jr. for over 30 years and his best friend. Hey. <laughs> so <laughs> real, quick, real quick, real quick. We have a new intern in here. Uh huh. What's your name again, bro? Anthony. Oh, Anthony. Anthony. So Austin's here now. This is your roommate. <laughs> I just told him, y'all, we've, everybody that listens to the podcast have heard the crackhead Anthony story. Oh, the my crackhead God. crackhead Austin story. We all know it. <laughs> Anthony. You're white. Um, t- tell me one fact about Sammy Davis Jr. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just tell me something about Sammy Davis Jr. Okay, but like, give me something about him now. Like, give me one song that he sang, one thing that he did, what movie that he was in right now. Okay, you don't know. So here's the fucking thing. The next time before you come in this room, <laughs> I need you to be able to give me something about Sammy Davis Jr. Wow. Only the top of the cream of the crop cool is white boys get to watch this podcast. <laughs> okay. John right here, married to a black woman. Really? Word up. Hey, give John a round of applause. Yes. <laughs> right, it's sister. a mess. You just said that. So I want to make sure yes. that we know. Yeah. You're respecting our, our greats in here. Yes. So your great your grandfather worked with Sammy. Absolutely. Who was in taps with Gregory Hines. That's one I give, yes. I give you one for free right there. Awesome. Yeah. Give you one for free. Yes. Um, so, tap is the name of the movie. Go ahead. Give so I say that to say that music was always in my DNA. So oh, okay. before this, I was in the music industry. I was a songwriter, vocal producer, traveled the world, writing for unsigned and signed artists. Okay, work. So yes. and you did that for the majority of your adult a life. The majority of my adult life. Before you decided to Yes. Do. So how did how did you get from there to being homeless? So my immediate a lot of my immediate family members passed away from uh, cancer. Oh wow. And so some in the music industry, you have your highs, you have your your lows. lows. Mm -hmm. And so that was my support system. Mm -hmm. I didn't have that support system anymore. Right. And so after that, you found yourself in a situation where... I found myself in a crisis situation where I had to go to a women's homeless shelter Mm. with my son. What was was that experience like? Um, We're sleeping on a a bunk bed cot with my son in the bed with me. And my whole mentality is like, my environment is not who I am. Mm. What to keep your if if I didn't have my mind, I would probably I wouldn't I wouldn't know what to do. Mm-hmm. I would probably be lost. But I stayed positive. I made sure that I used all the es- essential advice and tokens that that was passed down to me from my grandparents and my parents, and I used their experiences of where they messed up at, and I used that to catapult me. And I said, I need I want to do something. Mm-hmm. There's too many black people in this situation. There's too many Latinos. Why is it just this group of people? Mainly just this group of people. What can I do instead of walking on the street and protesting? What can I do to, to actually make a difference? And one of my friends, won't you run for office? You mm-hmm. know what? That's what I'm going to do. No matter what my situation is, it's my mindset that's going to push me forward. Mm-hmm. Let me tell you why that's powerful. I'll tell everyone why that's a powerful situation to me. When we talk about America and the fabric of what... Uh, the country is supposed to be built on. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the idea of America that we have, the sort of um, uh, pie in the sky idea that we have is that there's a person somewhere that's born into a situation or that finds himself into a situation or that observes a situation and goes, I'm going to change that. Mm -hmm. Right. And then what they do is through, excuse me, guile and talent and hard work, they build the necessary allegiances that they need yeah. and they start working and they change that situation. Mm-hmm. They attain some power and then they can look back at the community that they come from and, and really uh, engineer some sort of new system for those people. That's right. That's what we're told America is. Really, that's not what America is at all. What America is now 
is and what it's really always been is that America is about sort of oligarchs and people with a lot of money working with corporations in order to maintain the power and the control that they have. That's right. And that's the way politics normally works. Mm -hmm. George Bush, uh, who was a C student that ended up becoming the president of the United States, mm -hmm. had ancestors on the Mayflower. So, like, that goes back so much further than what any of us can comprehend. But mm -hmm. every once in a while, someone looks at the situation that they're in, mm -hmm. at the system that they come from, and they go, I can change that. Yeah. That is the best of America at work. Mm -hmm. That's the best of America. That's how things are supposed to go. Mm -hmm. And so that's specifically like what someone like yourself represents. Mm -hmm. You find yourself in a situation and you go, I know that if I did my thing, I'm talented enough mm -hmm. and I'm um, driven enough to get myself out of this. Of course. I know I can. Yeah. But what happens to everybody else? Mm -hmm. And the way real change really gets made is when people take on that responsibility. Absolutely. How has it been for you doing that as a mother, mm. kind of taking that responsibility on? Has it changed sort of the relationship or the, the time that you get to spend with your son? It, of course it changed the time, mm -hmm. but it made my relationship with my son even more valuable mm. because it helped me understand that I don't just exist for me or just my son. I exist for other people too. Mm -hmm. And so by taking him on, knock, knocking on doors with him. Oh, he goes with you. He goes with me. Taking him with me in these political arenas. He's actually really watching and taking this in. Mm -hmm. So it's really teaching him and myself at the same time. It's right. helping me become a better woman. It's helping me understand that giving back to my community, giving back to the people, it helps me grow. It helps me see my flaws. It helps me see how to polish myself. And I'm able to see how I'm influencing other people. And I'm like, dang, I can, I'm, I'm just doing this. I can do more. Right. And so all around, it, it's, it's, I, I can say it's exhilarating. It, sometimes it hurts. Sometimes it's uh, I'm excited. You know, I, it, it's so many different emotions, but overall is growth, growing pains and also just just being grateful. What's been the hardest part of being a politician? Going to these, into these different arenas. Um, uh, I look young. I'm 33 years old. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not an ugly person humbly and um <laughs> and you know humbly i'm bad as fuck <laughs> just want to let y'all know i'm not Dan, ugly. knock it off <laughs> humbly <laughs> but coming into these uh coming coming into the political arena knowing that there's a huge generational gap mm -hmm. and i'm a threat so sometimes people try to bully me but i stand my ground i stand in my truth some people try to, you know, sway me not to run, but I stand my ground. I stand my truth. I know what I'm in this for, and I'm in this for my community. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, sometimes people are a threat, and sometimes they kiss the ring. Mm. So, who? So, um, you said you, 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 you specifically mentioned your looks. Mm -hmm. um, is, is that a, has that been an issue? Has that been something that you feel like, like why? How, how is that? Because most time, most of the times, politicians, it's better off. If a politician is good looking, there's a very famous story. Mm -hmm. History time. Uh, the presidential debate back in the day. Um, Kennedy and Nixon. Mm -hmm. John F. Kennedy was a very handsome guy, suave mm -hmm. guy. Uh, the debate was televised. Mm -hmm. People that watched the debate on TV thought that Kennedy won because mm -hmm. Nixon looked sort of porous. He was sweating. And mm -hmm. Nixon's I remember, ugly yeah. Guy. yeah. People that listened to it on the radio, they thought that, uh, that excuse me, people that watch TV thought Kennedy won, people that listen on the radio, they thought that Nixon won. Right. Because the substance of what Nixon was talking about, they felt like he was a little bit better. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the first times that the American president uh, had to be the president on television and the aesthetic affects people in the way they look at things. Mm -hmm. you, like you said before, um, you're bad as fuck. So those are your words, not mine. Like you, so like, like you, like you said before, um, you're a, a pretty lady. Has that been a positive or a negative or has it affected in any way? When you mentioned it, have people played with you in any way? Mm -hmm. Has it been something that you've learned how to use? Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Of course, it's been something I've learned how to use. Okay. So it's a gift and a curse. All right. And I say that because there's a stereotype. Hey, if you're a well-looking person, mm -hmm. you're, you can't be that much intelligent. Right. You know, so with that, it's like I'm always being uh, uh, tested. Right. You know, so right. that's it, it, 
from women, Mm -hmm. (laughs) from men. You know, it's easier to maneuver that way. But then in every uh, industry or whatever, you know, they come at you, you know. Sure. Yeah. So it's a gift and a curse. And this is how I know that I'm ugly, by the way. I'll tell you why. Because when people give me compliments, it's always, Van, you're so intelligent. Never. Van, you're a good looking guy. Not really. Yes, you are. Never, (laughs) like, 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 never, never do they, never do they go, yo, Van, you're so sexy. That's okay. Mama thinks I'm handsome. Hey, when you take off your shirt on the Instagram post, and I know, I be seeing them comments, Van. Man, yeah, but y'all don't know who those comments come from. (laughs) Shout out to, like, like, shout out to, you know, you know, I get it. I, I got a certain demo that I'm busting. Ass. See, you're humble. A certain demo that I'm killing with. Y'all know who y'all are. I love y'all, and I love y'all great grandkids. See? See, you know you look um, good. Yeah. <laughs> love it. So, um, you, you're, so you're, you, you say that it's a little bit uh, difficult. Sometimes you say that the women don't take you seriously a little bit. More. Sometimes. Hmm. Sometimes. How do you get over that? I stand my ground. Hmm. I stand in my authority. Yeah. And then, then they'll open up and... Oh, okay, and you know, want to pass some tools down and different things like that. So mm-hmm. I guess that's just the way it's set up to be. Yeah, and, and, and when you talk about politics, you know, you winning a seat means that someone lost it. Yeah, absolutely. And so, like, well, it's an open seat right now. Oh, so it's the, an open the, seat. the person who's had this seat is, is the only black person on the, uh, on the board of five members. Mm-hmm. It's a male, and um, he's been in this seat for What's 12 his name? years. Mark Ridley Thomas. Mark Ridley Thomas. He's been in the seat for over 12 years, so mm-hmm. he's termed out. So he can't, so he can't, that's it. Termed out. Termed term out. Term limit. You, what she's talk, talking about, guys, is term limit and yes. everything. President gets two terms, so maybe, well, whatever, whatever. Right. Term limit. He's termed out. He can't yeah. run anymore. No. So it's an. It's called an open seat. It's an open seat. Yes. Who are you up against? I'm up against a uh, councilman mm-hmm. uh, named Herb Wesson. Mm-hmm. Okay. You I'm don't up, have to name the name. Oh, okay. Because, hey, like, when, I know. know when, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> I'm up against a councilman. I'm up against a state senator. I'm up against a former uh, councilwoman and um, two other unknowns. Okay. So we are uh, going to ask you a question right now. Mm-hmm. The question is, what is your platform? How are you going to transform this area of 2.5 million people or whatever? What are you going to do if and when you are elected? My platform is bottom line reform. Okay. A lot of our county programs, a lot of our uh, LAPD, sheriff, juvenile detention centers, um, uh, criminal justice, uh, homelessness. Everything needs to be reformed. Mm. I'm not trying to change the wheel, but I'm trying to polish it because we ha- we have the foundation of it's a what good politician line. By the way, is it? That's a good politician line. You see, you've been you're getting you're, you're learning quick, sister. But you know what? I'm not I don't, trying to change wanna... the wheel. I'm not trying to change the wheel. I'm trying to polish it. Well, That's I say point. that because we have the foundation, mm-hmm. but if you've never experienced being homeless, if you've never experienced these things, how can you really solve the problem? And there's uh. nobody on that board that's experienced these things that they're trying to combat, mm-hmm. but they can't solve it because they've never used a county program. Mm-hmm. They just go by what's being told to them. Right. With all due respect, they've probably did the best that they can. Mm-hmm. However, in order to fix something, you have to have experienced it. Okay, so let's just take one of those problems. How would you reform the LAPD? Ooh. Let's LAPD. Let's talk about uh, the section where we are dealing with gangs. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've researched, and there's 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 no program that I've seen that besides inside the LAPD mm-hmm. as far as gang reform or intervention. Mm-hmm. And there's an issue right now where if you're affiliated with a gang or you're a gang member, mind you, you can grow up in a certain neighborhood right. and automatically be affiliated with a gang member. Right. And um, you take a candy bar from the store. That's an extra 10 years to 25 years to life because you're affiliated with this gang. Hmm. That's, I I feel that's corruption. I feel that's discrimination. I feel that those certain policies needs to be changed. Right, right. And you feel like from your seat as a county supervisor you could change that how? How does that get done? What do you do? So I would come up with a policy because we're able to implement policies mm-hmm. inside the county. Right. So I would come up with a policy to counteract that. Mm-hmm. 
So I can't change what's already in place, but we can bring about policies to counteract that, to null and void that out. Right, I get it. Yeah. Um, in terms of what you saw as far as being used, having to use the, um, the, um, the resources of the county, mm -hmm. uh, if you are a young single mother yes. that finds herself in a homeless situation, mm -hmm. how would you like to see that sort of uh, situation be better and be more Ooh, thank you better. for asking that question mm -hmm. so right now if you're a young single mother and um, you're in a homeless situation the county only has a homeless program where they give you 16 days in a hotel mm -hmm. or a motel after that you need to go find a nonprofit or something to see if they have shelter right. well all of the shelters are full so the only other way to do it what I'm seeing is you have to declare yourself mentally ill. Oh, I have depression, or I have this, or schizophrenia, in order for them to immediately put you into a, an apartment mm -hmm. and help you pay your rent until you're able to stand on your own. There's no program for people who are well competent, who have a job, maybe have messed up credit, and can't get in nowhere. Right. So just little things like that. How can, how, what's 16 days? That's not enough days to get yourself back on your feet. Mm -hmm. So those little things need to be smoothened out right yeah so it, it when you talk about extending programs or widening them for people do you know what people are going to ask you they're going to ask you how you're going to pay for it mm -hmm. do you have any plans on how where you get the money from the kind of uh, we have the funding we do we have the funding now the question is where's the funding going or being diverted to is a whole another issue mm -hmm. So you feel like the money's there, but the it's not money going is to the people who want. Who definitely it. there. It's just not going directly to the people. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you why. What I, else I've experienced is if you house 1,500 people on your waiting list to get housing, if you house all those people, this organization won't have a job anymore. Mm. So people are holding on to their jobs because if, if it looks like you're 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 if, the, if it looks like your organization is in need, mm -hmm. then you get more funding. Right. If you have this many people on your waiting list to get housed, you, you get more funding. So you feel like those people are juking the system in order to keep themselves employed. Of course. Because they don't want to solve a problem. They want to keep it going. Unfortunately, that's one of the issues. So yeah. I would say divert some of that funding to your smaller organizations that are effective. The smaller ones are being more effective mm -hmm. and they're not getting funding from the county. Right. But if they did get funding, they would, they would, they're effective. Right. They've been proven to be effective. But the bigger ones, absolutely, there's definitely corruption going on. What, um, what specific uh, part of Los Angeles are you from? L.A. You're from L.A. Adams and Western. I've also grew up in Inglewood. I've lived in Gardena and Carson. So the whole second district that I'm running for, I've, I've pretty much lived in most of those, majority of those cities. Mm -hmm. What's the most prevalent problem you see in those areas? Homelessness. Um, when I go to Watts, there's, there's three uh, uh, projects all in one. Most of those people in the, those projects are blacks. Mm -hmm. You know, and another thing that's going on is the police shootings, you know, and not being held accountable, you know. Um, uh, those are the main things. Hmm. Well, how do you feel like you can change them? reform bringing bringing programs and funding those programs bringing res uh, tangible resources into our black communities mm -hmm. into our latino communities you feel like there's an answer to the gang situation in los angeles absolutely what would you say the answer is i would say bringing influencers in mm -hmm. who have been in a gang who have been affiliated with gangs and are now successful uh, success stories from that right. bringing them uh, bringing your OGs into the, the juvenile detention centers and talking to these to these boys mm -hmm. um, who are now uh, productive members of society. Right. You know, um, finding a way to bring funding into the gangs as long as they're uh, uplifting and not uh, putting them in the way to, hey, you got to go rob this person or you got to go do this. Give them a, give them a funnel of, um, of funding to actually bring them jobs. To do good work. To do good work. Mm. So it's still an organization, right? Right. So let's reform how we perceive this organization and uplift these kids because you never know what background or home they're coming from. Yeah. You never know if they're being abused. You never know if their parent from the crack cocaine era are not 
you know, around. So they need to, they need a father figure. Most of our father figures are locked up, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it, you utilize that to catapult. Right. How has your life changed in terms of like, so you're a politician, right? So being that you're a politician, she's a politician. Everybody. <laughs> Oh, Lord, don't say that. But I'm a representative of my community. Politician. Uh, <laughs> but so now, uh, you know, there comes a different sort of uh, gaze that comes with that, right? Like, mm -hmm. there's a, like, um, like I remember uh, <clears throat> I was in New York uh -huh. eating with my manager. Shout uh -oh. out to Karen Kinney. We're eating and somebody walks by and they go, yo, is, is that Van Lathan? Yeah. You see him saying that? With a white woman? I'm like, yo, that's my manager, though. Uh -oh. <laughs> like, I'm like, hey, before you go to the shade, that's my manager. You know what I'm saying? Because people, they look at you different when you have a little bit of, you know what I'm saying? So for you personally, do you move in different ways? Do you, re do you go different places? Like, now that people know that, like, you're out there and, like, you know, mm -hmm. politics is a dirty game, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. So, so, so like, how have, you, how have you switched up? I haven't switched up. Cause you weren't you weren't out there you were out there before you weren't like hitting the clubs and doing any of that stuff. Sometimes I might still go to the club because mm. I got friends that are promoters. I want to support them. Mm. You know, some t I'll go hang out with my people in, this, in the studios. Right. I do not change who I am. That's what makes me different. I'm in the communities. I'm talking to people. I'm I'm still connected to my community and the people in my community. It's where I'm from. Right. That's where I come from. So. I don't want to change up anything. Mm. People need to know that I got their back, that they could trust me. Right. That's that's important for me because my my special interest is the people. I don't mm. owe nothing to nobody else but the people, and that's why I'm doing this. That that brings me to another point. How are you funding your campaign? Dollar by dollar, knocking on doors, five dollars by five dollars. Mm. Yep. Real grassroots. Real grassroots. So you haven't had any sort of business or corporate interests that have come in and been like, yo, we wanna we wanna put you on. Nope, not at all. Are you interested in that? Nope, not at all. You're interested in having the money come straight for the people? Straight from the people. And how, how has that been going? It's, it's tough sometimes. Honestly, it's tough sometimes. Because some of my opponents, you know, they, they're already at 500000 with their oil companies or with their big corporations. But that's not my focus. Right. My focus is, hey, you can contribute a dollar, five dollars, twenty, a hundred, up to fifteen hundred dollars. Do that. Mm -hmm. But my focus is to make sure that, hey, it's, this is tangible. You can run for office too. You don't have to have a, a special degree and all this college to 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 do this. Mm -hmm. This is tangible. Right. This is a different way that we can per perceive things. So, yeah. so let's look at the worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. The worst case scenario is like you don't. Win. Mm -hmm. How would you continue to impact and help your community? What would be what would be your mission until the next time you ran? Mm -hmm. um, how do you stay engaged in continuing to change things, even though you might not have the seat that you want? Mm -hmm. So I would continue to be in my community, mobilize my community, build organizations and coalitions, use influencers to inspire our youth. Because if we don't invest in our youth, then our future is not looking too good it's not looking too good right now right. so continue use this platform to as long term and catapult it to continue to inspire continue to uh, bring awareness uh, continue to acknowledge those who are behind the scenes that don't get acknowledged um, content go out and t I, I mean I'm I am also building relationships with uh, your your county sheriffs your uh, chief of police, you know, your DAs. I still have these relationships. So still using those relationships to benefit the community and spread awareness and bring awareness and change. To say, hey, this is how many vote. I may not have won, but this is how many voters came out to vote for me. Right. This is still leveraging power. Right. Still leveraging that power. Are there any uh, local politicians here or local or organizers here that you see specifically that, is, that are doing good work that you would like to be closer to or work more with? Yeah. Um, uh, there's a guy out of Compton, Hub, Hub City Dre. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, there's so many, Van, putting me on the spot right no, now. No, I'm just asking. I'm just saying, <laughs> yo, if we like, really, to be honest with you, uh, the, the, uh, one of the reasons why I, I, I had you on is, number one, we're, gonna, we're about to do, uh, here on the Red Pill, 
mm-hmm. a couple of podcasts that focus more specifically on what's going on mm-hmm. um, at the local level to make mm-hmm. sure that people understand that's very important. Yeah. I'm going to have a, um, a black sheriff mm-hmm. on. Okay. Pretty soon. Ooh. I know you guys know how I feel Uh-oh. about the police, so that should be fun. Uh-oh. Um, drill them, uh, drill them. I, I just want to have <laughs> I want to have conversations with people that resonate all over the country. Yeah. Um, about what can make us get up and and build coalitions, like I said before, because like one of my tightest homies and one of the smartest men in this entire country, Killer Mike, always talks about. I state. love him. Yeah, always talks about state. And the local yes. government. And yes. If we don't have these conversations about state and local government on a national level. Yes. They're not going to go anywhere. Yes. Um. So I asked you about people around uh, town because there's some people that I would like to connect with and mm-hmm. make sure that they have what it is that they need. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you feel like there is change happening? And do you feel like your youth in any way um, is part of that? What I mean is, are the young people that you see now moving differently? Have you been able to have uh, more fruitful conversations with them are they more engaged than what you've seen before growing up in LA absolutely I feel like over the years the people have become more conscious especially since Trump has been in office mm-hmm. we've been forced to to try to work together and figure this out you know like like when the whole issue with Gucci how we came together hey let's not buy from Gucci right. you know we're learning how to uh, do things in a different way and more effective I definitely see change. I really like the the revolt summit that uh, they recently happened and that conversation. And so uh, I feel like it resonated. I feel like a lot of people are more aware, more conscious nowadays, for sure. Do you are well, first of all, you 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 ran as a Democrat? I was. Assuming? Yes. Um, what do you feel about the idea of political parties? I have to be honest with you. I'm no longer a Democrat. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't have a political party. I'm with you. I'm, I'm I I. I I'm liberal, but I just don't believe in the structure of political parties anymore. I don't think it works for anyone, especially black people. What do you think about that? I'm totally with you on that, Ben. Uh, In the Democratic Party uh, arena, um, a lot of people have turned their backs on me Mm -hmm. because their interest is in other people. Their their funding is through those politicians. And so I'm like, hey, do these people really want to change things or are they just trying to keep their stuff going for their own you know and so it just made me get a different perspective also uh, i like the things killer mike was saying how you know right now we're arguing over who has the best master yeah you know and so i really i really don't believe in any party lines i believe at the end of the day we're u.s citizens Hmm. and and we'll get more things done by working together right yeah who are you supporting the candidate right now on the democratic side do you You know i'm I'm still on the fence right now like who are you narrowing it down to I'm, I'm narrowing it down to Bernie. You know, I, they keep putting J- Joe Biden in the pinnacle of things. Yeah. Um, Fuck Joe Biden, though. He, he, uh, you know, it's it's Sorry. really shout hard out to... to <laughs> shout out to Simone and all the other... No, nah, I mean, like, listen, listen shout it's out to hard. Simone and everybody else that's, that's working real hard. He's got some good people working yeah. with him, but... No. Yeah. Um, uh, no. Bu- Buttigieg. Bu- Buttigieg. I forgot. Buttigieg. It. Yeah. Buttigieg. Yeah. He's yeah, he's, he's pretty cool. He's a fantastic yeah. candidate. He's he's awesome. He's an amazing candidate. Very authentic. He's a, very authentic. Um, wait, when I say he's a fantastic candidate, I mean just that. I don't know how he would be as a president, right? Because, um, you know, he doesn't have very much experience at that level. But he, as far as a candidate, the dude can be eloquent about anything. Absolutely. You have Kamala Harris. You have yeah. Yang. Yeah. Um, you have. A, a lot of different people. We have yeah. Elizabeth Warren. Um, oh, she's bad ass. She's bad. She's great. <laughs> the problem, this is the problem with me. The problem is this. Uh-oh. The problem is I have a hangover. And my hangover is from President Obama. The reality is this. As a candidate, Forget about the presidency because that was a different thing. We can have arguments all day long about whether or not the Obama presidency delivered on what we thought it was going to deliver right. on. But as a candidate, you had uh, a charismatic, affable, black, constitutional uh, law professor. He was swag. The editor of the Harvard Law Review. You had excellence personified. You had grace with his wife. Yes. You had, um, an unbelievable journey 
of someone who built themselves. And then you had a guy that if you ask him a question, he was just able to deliver. Uh, deliver. And then you had this weird sort of almost spiritual authenticity, right? Mm -hmm. You had someone who like, uh, like you see, when you see Obama like playing with a kid, the reason why those Obama kid videos go so <laughs> crazy is because he looks like he's really having a good time. Yeah, like it, it, like you see everybody else, they kiss the baby, and then right away they turn around. It's robotic, and mouth, and right? Like, you're like, oh, you don't really. Like the that smile goes away. Like baby. You don't yeah, fuck with that kid, right? But Obama looks like he's legitimately loving people. He looks like he legitimately cares. Mm -hmm. Now he became president. Then he droned a bunch of people. However, like the 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 reality is that on the campaign trail, I don't feel tethered to any of these people. I think a lot of these um, <laughs> programs and things that they want to put forth mm -hmm. are would be great if they could execute them. But if you look at the landscape of government, they can't and they yeah. know that they can't. So what I want more out of a president than anyone or of a politician than anyone is I want someone I know who that cares about people. Mm -hmm. Because if you care about people, you won't be so quick to shut anyone down. Absolutely. Meaning... If you're some, if you're some gun nut, right, mm -hmm. uh, and you you live in Tallahassee, Florida, or you live in Lexington, Kentucky, or you live Tupelo, Mississippi, you live in Jacksonville, wherever you live, if I actually care about the fact that you care about that, I'm not going to treat you like some kind of enemy. Mm -hmm. Now, I will tell you that I think that your passions are misdirected, mm -hmm. and as a country, we might need to comp compromise. To get to a better place mm -hmm. but i'm not just gonna act like you're subhuman right and that goes for anything mm -hmm. i think now what we have are politicians that are really just like social media influencers yeah. that are angling so hard for applause yes that they're not feeling the heartbeat and the soul there's something missing you can tell it's antiseptic it, it's something missing like it, it just there's something not right like and that scares me that trump is gonna get another term i mean look to be honest with you i'm just being Transparent. I'll be honest with you. I, I, I hope that because it doesn't happen. But I'll be honest with you. But the way it looks, if that's what I'm saying. All yeah. the candidates is like some, you know, it's like it's not authentic. It's something. It's that it that's missing. Right. And, and in order to believe that someone that has a plan, you have to really believe that. In order to someone to believe someone can execute a plan, you have to think that they actually believe in it. Mm -hmm. Right. Because mm -hmm. like if we're all in this room, right, we're trying to escape from this room and the back of it's on fire and you go and one guy goes you know I think what we should do is this and another guy goes no he uses the line from Terminator he says come with me if you want to live Boom. remember that you like that joint they say that in every Terminator movie by the way they should stop saying it it's T2 it says come with me no 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 bullshit motherfucking <laughs> you know what you're talking about Kyle Reese says that in the, oh, and see what I'm saying that's my fucking problem with you <laughs> that started in the original Terminator Kyle Reese Says that to Sarah Connor. He says, yeah. come with me if you want to live. Then they can't keep recycling it. Because then the fucking T-800, he then says, come with me if you want to live. And then they then they keep coming back to the come yeah. with me if you want to live. My point is this. If everybody's in the room and one guy says, I think we should go this way. And another guy says, come with me if you want to live. Who are you going to follow? I'm coming with you because I want to live. Because I want to live. I'm telling you, I believe this is the way out. And everybody else on this fucking, th they, they're all these weird platitudes. Cory Booker was talking about Kool-Aid. Don't do that no more. Oh, Lord. Senator Booker. Don't do that. There's something missing. What's wrong with you? What's wrong with your eyes, dog? Anyway, um, like, like have y'all have have seen that? <laughs> like, it's like, it's like Cory Booker looks like he's getting electrocuted. You know, like every time you, Man. I'm just I'm saying like I'm no I'm just I'm being for real like like what's it's, it's, tell it like it is it's like, you know so what I'm saying is that like for uh, out of a politician which is essentially a leader you want someone that you think uh, is really invested and has a belief mm -hmm. um, and so that's what I'm not feeling right now same here yeah. and that's why I'm looking for people in and around LA mm -hmm. that regardless whether or not, um, not just in LA, in my my home city of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, too. Shout out to Ted James. I know that Ted got it on, on lock over there. Uh, the young politician coming up doing this thing. All right. I'm Get looking for people that I can believe in. 
even if you even if we need to work together on some of these plans, even we, we mm-hmm. need to figure out the people we need to I'm looking for people mm-hmm. that I know care about people. Mm-hmm. That's the number one thing. Absolutely. You gotta know that somebody cares about people. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And talking to you, first of all, you were very persistent about coming on the podcast, which means that you care. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, but talking to you, you've been in a situation to where I know that you're going to bust your ass to try to make something happen. That's right. So what are the next steps then? Like, when is the election? How much time? How much money do you need to be raised? Mm-hmm. Um, how can people that are listening to this, how can they help us out? Um, next steps? Well, the election is March 3rd, 2020. Oh, we, sure. have, we have 11. So I'll be on the presidential ballot, but, on, but locally. Uh, we have 11 days to vote this time around. Uh, so I think that's around February 24th to March 3rd. I may be a little off on my numbers, but um, I need at least about s- to raise 60000 until then. Uh, the most that individuals can ra- uh, can uh, donate is up to 1500 mm-hmm. Uh You can do that from my website, ShariceRhodes.net, mm-hmm. S-H-A-R-I-S-R-H-O-D-E-S.net. And... Um, yeah. How much do you have raised? Maybe about 5000 right now. 5000 Yeah. So we got some work to do. We have some work to do. You know what we should do? What's that? That's what we should do. I'm going to really come up yes. with something right now. This day. <laughs> we should do what's called the turn-up ticket. Okay. Because you say you know a lot of party promoters, right? Yeah. We should do functions in LA Ooh. to benefit. See, this is what you need. You see what the fuck I'm talking about? Praise man. God. This is what This is what I do. We should have functions in L.A. to where we party for a purpose. I'm with it. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm going to be honest with you. Adib, fucking Milt, Deverin, Vic, all my guys from Made Entertainment, mm-hmm. Shane, all my dudes from Supreme Team. Mm-hmm. I come in, I drink with y'all anyway. I drink up all the liquor. Shout out Marquise Diamond. Marquise, I like shout that's, out like, that's the homie. <laughs> I, I, I drink up all the liquor in it, but we should party for a purpose because we can take some of this celebration. Because it's white people, we love to celebrate. Yeah, I know. We love to have a good time. Mm-hmm. We love, but what we what we do is we end up giving our money to Hennessy. We end up giving our money to fucking Universal Music Group. We give our money to fucking uh, whoever, right? Mm-hmm. And then after we had we've had the experience, we don't have nothing left. Mm-hmm. It would be good if we could some way take our need to celebrate and, yeah. and, 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 and be with one another and turn it into something lasting that we can put our hands in. Yeah. And I'm talking about economic la- mm-hmm. uh, longevity. I'm talking mm-hmm. about uh, you know social longevity. I'm also talking about political longevity. So we have to find a way to merge all of these things you like to do. You, you, you know these guys, these promoters? Mm-hmm. Don't just go to their parties man make mm-hmm. them like bring them in yeah because they 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 making that money man yeah i tell you how i know they're making money i play in the basketball league on monday nights santa monica basketball league uh-huh. a couple of weeks ago i had 37 austin they keep talking about Ooh, you're pretty good league. bust your ass Ooh. So they know they weren't <laughs> let me tell you something let me tell you something he clowned number one they weren't they weren't 50 but they were white and they were five foot seven <laughs> don't, don't, and, and, and here's the deal. Here's the deal. Don't matter if you're on the court. Your food and the big boy gonna eat. Ooh. Also, I can't wait till you get out there. I'm gonna fuck you over anyway. I gotta see you in action, man. Uh, I put some. I put I'll some, be your cheerleader. Yo, here's the deal. I put some clips up on the internet. Here's the problem with the clips. When you're in the game, uh huh. When you're in the game and you're and you're cooking, you, you thinking, yo, I'm LeBron, nigga. <laughs> <laughs> like, like seriously, it's like turn back the clock, 1997, Kimberly versus Santa Monica shit. Like, I'm thinking, yo, I'm crazy. <laughs> then you watch the video of yourself. Oh no! And you're like, why in the fuck did they let Al Roker on the basketball court? <laughs> oh my god! Like, do you like why you you're moving so slow? <laughs> it looks like your knees hurt, and you and you and you and you, and you, and you, and you, and you thinking to yourself. There's no fucking way that this is how... And then you start thinking weird shit like, is this because I'm 39 or have I always looked like this? Oh, my God. You think, like, you think like have I always looked this crazy playing basketball? <laughs> like, was I was I playing in high school and then having my mama go, my poor baby. Oh you know what I'm saying? Oh, my God. Um, no. But what I'm saying is I hoop with these guys. I know they got money because 
I'm rolling up in a Honda Accord Cross Tour, and right. all my promoter homies, they 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 whipping. Yeah. So what I'm saying is, maybe we should put less of that money into Range Rover and more of that money into Charisse. You know Absolutely. What I'm but, we, but what we're, what we're going to do, mm-hmm. no matter what it is, is figure out a way to get you the money that you need. Okay. Because win or lose, first or second. First of all, all we want is wins. That's right. Um, but win or lose, first and second, there's one thing that we have to prove mm-hmm. as young black people is that we are here to support each other. Absolutely. And we're here to grow with one another. Love it. I do this podcast. I hope to grow as a host. I hope to grow as a voice. I hope to grow as an entertainer and an educator, right? Mm-hmm. You hope to grow as a political voice, as a, as a community organizer. We mm-hmm. want to look back five, six, seven years from now and be like, yo, remember when we did this? Yep. Now look at this. Mm-hmm. In order to do this, we got to build partnerships, and I am telling you right now uh, that I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that you have what you need. The same here. All right, we good? If we good. Hey, look, y'all clap for Cherise Rose right now. Man, thank you so much. No problem. <laughs> Once again, tell them where they can, what they can donate and like what, what they can do. CherisRose.net, S-H-A-R-I-S-R-H-O-D-E-S.net. Dot net. Uh, did you ever play any sports? Any? I used to run track. You did? What, yes, what the 400, the 4x2, four the 4x4. Four Oh, okay. And the 800. So you ran the 400 and 800. Yep. Which was your most trash event? Which one did you suck the most at? Oh, my goodness. Most uh, trash. I didn't suck. I still got records in my high school. Oh, work? Yeah. I oh, was like good. that? I was like that. Oh, f- oh, for real? Yeah. Oh, like so you that. used to run fast. Yeah, I was, I was, I was, I had long distance. I had longevity, endurance, mm-hmm. and I was fast. Yeah. Yeah. I'm fast too. It was, I thought I was fast. Now I'm not so fucking sure. We got to race one day then. You know uh, what I'm nah, saying? Nah, I'm, I'm not doing that. Like, <laughs> Come what, on, what, man. What, 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 what? I just you got testosterone. You. That's a little you. bit. I got a little less weight than you. But you, but you know, that's an equal. You don't, you don't think that I'm to the point in my life. You scoring 37 in a game. That don't matter. Come on now. Like, they're like, yeah, man. Like, it's not, it's like, <laughs> I, I, scored, I, I scored 37, but you know how I know that that 37 weren't real? Aww. So the, it was It was a real 37 I was cooking, but those guys were complimenting me. Oh, while shut I was, up. So that's Shut how I know up. it was like it was like oh yeah, that's cold boy that's a great move bro like, that's nah. cold I'm like I'm like, I'm like and you I, look and back I, like they was lying I, to me it, the it whole the time I felt bad for talking shit a dude comes over runs up like he goes oh, close out close out here the three I go hey shit you can do about that he goes I know man I'm like nah it's not real it's not real we Damn. out 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 it's not real we out it's not real we out it's not real we are. It's not real. 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 We are. It's not real.